Okay, it's so nice that everybody joined or we have all our speakers and uh, let's give it a start. We have Paul Gerritsen, Director of Delta Metropole over here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much everybody for joining. Uh, I hope everybody is having a good day till now and we are very excited to start this meeting and have a good discussion over the afternoon. So I see now that people are gradually already settling down with this new digital format. So we are doing this for the second time. This is the sixth new planning dialogue. And uh, we tried this in the last previous one. And we did learn a lot of small and big technical things during the last one. But uh, there might be still some ups and downs today. So please bear with us and help us improvise. We are expecting around 50 to 60 participants. I can see right now we are around 32. Uh, so there might be new people joining in in next few minutes. Uh, I'm Alankrita Sarkar. I'm working with Data Metropolis Association. I'm the project leader for the new planning. And uh, I'll be one of the moderators for today. Paul Gerritsen and uh, Matthias Lenher will be helping me in some parts of the session for, our, for the moderation. And we'll be having a lot of conversation with uh, various panel members and uh, it, we really want it in a more interactive session. So we really want our audience to jump in with questions and uh, discussions wherever they want to uh, join. Uh, Matthias, I cannot see you yet. Are you there already? Uh, yes, I'm there and I can see me myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, just uh, maybe try rejoining once more if you can, if that is fine, because... I'm not sure if other people can see me and hear me. We can hear yeah. you definitely. Uh, and see you. I okay. can see him also. Okay. Yes. That's good. Okay. Uh, so, Paul Gerritsen, the director of Data Metropolis Association, will be one of the uh, moderators for today. Paul, you want to say hi to everybody? Sure. Hi. Um, very welcome. Also from my side, um, we uh, we are in different rooms in the same building. So, uh, so actually, we're all spread out. Uh, funnily enough, uh, throughout the office uh, now, uh, in order to avoid uh, um, strange zooming sounds. Um, so, uh, yeah, very welcome. Also from uh, from my uh, uh, part. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Matthijs Lehner, he's a program manager from BNA International and Next Step program. He will be helping us moderating some of the parts as well. And he has a really important role to conclude the session. So welcome, Matthijs. Thank you very much, Alan Krita, and thanks for uh, inviting us. And we are happy to be a bit of a co-organizer of this very interesting event today. Thank you so much. Let's see how uh, nicely we can continue today. Uh, this is always a question with the digital setup. We don't know where it falls down, but uh, let's give it a try. So to just have a smooth session today, there are a few instructions that I would like to remind all of you. You might have already received the email from us, but these are some practical uh, points. So for all the speakers, panel members, moderators, we would like to keep it as crisp and short as possible and let's try to finish it on time. We want to make it as interactive as possible, but it is really essential that the, um, all the audience are muted most of the time unless and until they are asking any question. Uh, the chat box is very much, you're very much welcome to write your questions, your um, any issues that you're having, any technical issues for the chat box. Malvika from our side will be keeping an eye over the chat box and you can also ask specific questions to her in terms of technical problems. Yes, hi everyone. And uh, sometimes we might ask you to uh, turn off the video so that we can just have the panel members on the screen and the panel discussion can go on a bit smoothly. We are, uh, the, we are dividing 
ourselves in smaller breakout rooms in the mid of the session so please don't press leave the meeting any time during the whole session we'll make sure that you are in the right place at the right time during the coffee break we would suggest that you just switch off your video and switch up off the audio and you can take the break time uh lastly we advise all of you to name rename yourself in the zoom setting uh there is an option at the right bar of participants where you can rename yourself and just put your name and organization so that everybody knows who else is joining the meeting and who is speaking at the at what time uh please uh, keep that in mind that the video this session is being recorded and it is also being live streamed on youtube so we might also take some photos and screenshot during the meeting so let's start with uh, the program today as i already mentioned paul and mathias will be helping me with the moderation part this is the program for today we are dividing the whole program into four parts the first two parts are uh, two panel discussions uh, paul kheretson would be the moderator during this part the third part is presentations from archides netherlands and be sustainable brussels and the fourth part and uh, is the reflecting back part where we will have smaller breakout sessions and uh, mathias will be helping us with the conclusion so i don't know if everybody knows about new planning already or not so just a super small uh, introduction to new planning dialogue uh, so the new planning dialogue is a combination of research dialogue and community of practice and we are also now working on the end results and publication and this project aims to stimulate a change in the practice of spatial planning to ensure a more sustainable and inclusive development in the dutch context as well as the european context so we are taking help uh, from our european friends and sit peers who uh, are learning with us but also giving us some inspiration to work in the spatial planning background we discuss various scales and subjects to answer the big question that how to effectively plan for the big challenges we already have had uh, five successful uh, activities this is a series of eight activities and we are in the sixth one now uh, in last five we have discussed about the current urgencies in planning defining the am right ambitions uh about the national planning vision the regional scale and the formalization part and the most recent one was the city scale one where we discussed about the city visions and decision making process that was the first digital event of the series and uh, today we are doing the sixth one and we are still left with two upcoming interesting uh, sessions in october so keep in touch with us and those sessions are more about the role of planner and role of spatial planning and design and the mega region scale focusing on euro delta so i would like to mention that today's event partners are uh, bna international and archides netherlands they have been contributing a lot to develop the program and supporting us to develop the content for today um topic for today is super interesting for both our partners but also all the new planning enthusiasts in the recent times we are all focusing and questioning on a lot about the global agreements and uh, uh, global agreements and we are today we are trying to take this opportunity to check that how relevant they are in today's planning context how important they are to plan and provide us a guideline for the planning system and as well as to see how we can apply these in our projects so of course in some way or the other these are providing a direction to the planning system but uh, at the same time the question remains that uh, what exactly are the definitive roles for these uh, uh, agreements and declarations so let's do a quick exercise we start with uh, a small mentimeter reactions for everybody uh this is you can just uh, follow this link or go to menti.com uh leia my colleague is already putting it in the chat box so you can follow that link 
and uh, put your responses. I'll share the screen so that you all can see what everybody is answering. Can everybody access this? Yeah, I can see nice answers coming in. Okay, quite nice. I think uh, I'll give some more time for everybody to start uh, answering this while I ask, uh, I would like to ask Paul Gerritsen that uh, he is the initiator of the new planning dialogue and he strongly feels about this subject. So first of all, uh, I would like him to react on this audience response. What does he feel about it? And also please tell us that what do you expect from today's session and how important are these agreements according to you? Okay, um, well, thank you very much, Alan Krita. Um, I'm not so sure if I'm the, um, uh, the, the initiator of this, uh, of, this, um, of this program. I think um, it's important to mention that this, um, the new planning initiative started out as a conversation between uh, practice and academia. So our conversation with uh, TU Delft. Uh, with uh, Vincent Nedin, uh, Professor Nedin at that moment. Um, we had this conversation that actually, uh, how, how can it be that planning plays, plays such a minor role um, in times of this radical and global change? Should not planning, in, uh, particularly in the Netherlands, play a much bigger uh, role in uh, informing uh, policy, informing change, also societal change? Um, and uh, how can it be that um, uh, although uh, planning for a long time very much institutionalized in the Netherlands uh, has been put politically uh, next to the garbage uh, in this time where we really need uh, to uh, look forward uh, in order to cope with this uh, sort of mind-boggling change that is um, that we need to uh, to to deal with so uh, how can it be that this capacity for looking into the future um, is uh, is so much devaluated? And uh, so that is uh, that was the that was the main question. And uh, we thought it would be useful to not do this within the context of the Netherlands, but particularly um, seek a contact with our um, colleagues in uh, all over the world, but particularly in in uh, in, in Europe. Uh, to start a process of, um, um, well, inspire each other. And I think this is an important element in, uh, of this. This is also why we're doing this as an international um, um, series of meetings at the moment. And I think it's also very important to, um, to see the inspiration that we can get from different um, areas outside of the Netherlands. So basically I think that's an important aspect. I would also today like to see if we can get some um, inspiration from uh, from elsewhere. Perhaps also even though you might be from, uh, from uh, the Dutch uh, context you would know uh, certain 
um, examples from elsewhere and maybe they can inspire us. Because I think it's important to, uh, to mention that uh, for today, we have this, um, uh, this focus. Uh, so we have done numerous uh, uh, subjects, sub subjects you could say within the, the new planning, coping with different skills, with, uh, um, with a new national vision. We, we late last year did a big conference uh, about that. We've uh, done um, the, uh, the, the, the peer reviews between cities, but today we would like to focus on, on the role and the purpose for planning um, um, in regards to a large international agreements and, um, um, uh, and, uh, and declarations. Uh, how do they inform our planning? How can we use them? How can we operationalize them? Um, and um, I think it's important to, um, to state that actually in the Netherlands, we've lost a little bit of this capacity of uh, looking ahead, planning for that. Um, uh, we don't have a really great track record when it comes, for instance, to the energy transition or to uh, our natural environment. Um, um, well, um, explosive uh, livestock issues that we have, um, excessive mobility. Somehow we've lost our way in many of these very uh, challenging subjects and um, we need we need to change and um, and um, and therefore it's it's important to see how how this international um, um, declarations can play a role in it. Uh, I think it's important to maybe look back a little bit. Um, it's interesting to um, to note that if we look at the Paris Climate Agreement, I think um, by far one of the most important um, um, agreements we have uh, currently. Um, keeping our, or at least that's the goal, um, uh, and the, the climate change and the change of temperature well within, well below two degrees, uh, is definitely a historic agreement and um, is set, uh, set, setting a lot of things in motion at the moment. But it's important to think back uh, maybe a little bit um, uh, when at the moment when, when this kind of uh, declarations were very much seen as a solution to um, to our big challenges, and that is uh, almost 30 years ago in um, November uh, 1989, when there was the first uh, international um, conference on climate change in Noordwijk uh, in the Netherlands, um, ironically uh, actually chaired by Ed Nijpels, our current uh, national uh, climate agreement chair. Um, and um, I don't know how many of you uh, read the article from a couple of years ago from the New York Times magazine, Losing Earth, uh, which described the whole process uh, around uh, actually the failing of reaching agreement at that moment. Um, so um, if you read that article by Nathiel Rich, uh, it's, in, it's interesting to see that actually um, at that moment we, we thought this kind of international agreement will be able to cope with uh, these very difficult um, subjects. We have just uh, addressed uh, at that moment uh, quite um, effectively um, the, the hole in the ozone layer at that moment with banning uh, CFKs. So why should that not work with uh, CO2 was the idea. Um, so basically, that, that at that moment, 30 years ago, this, um, this agreement failed, means a lot, actually, I think, today, uh, because it's, it makes our current work so much more pressing, but also so much more difficult. Um, Rich uh, blames actually human nature for, uh, for not being able to reach this kind of agreement. Uh, but you can also, in this article, read very well that perhaps it's failing government that could be blamed for this. Um, and even bad luck, I think. Wrong people uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, later on, Na Naomi Klein reacted on this article and she actually said we should blame capitalism and particularly the neoliberal form of that and large corporations that effectively actually made sure that this kind of agreement would not be installed at that moment. 
So um, it's uh, it's interesting to see, and it's also interesting to to now look forward to this day and age and think about what is the role of international agreements. They need to cope with all of these different elements, how to inform government, how to inform society, how to change our economy, and we have to find ways of making, making them operational. And how do we do that? So I would like to, um, to point towards that subject, particularly where it goes um, in, the, in the field of the urban and spatial planning, and how can, um, how can these kind of agreements inform this kind of effect, uh, effective planning agenda. Um, so basically, that's a little bit what I would like to get out of this uh, conversation. Uh, it's a lot, um, but we also have quite some time, so I'm curious uh, what we will end up at, uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, no, that's uh, really uh, good that you have laid the introduction for everybody. So there is some already question. I am quite sure that people will always have these questions in mind. So just I'm inviting everybody to start putting any question, even if it is to Paul in the chat box, and we can take those up later during the discussion. Paul, do you want to comment on the Mentimeter to this question that uh, what everybody thinks is a primary role of declaration and agreements? I can see a lot of agenda setting to set a benchmark, setting the rules of game and anticipated uh, endpoint values to set common goals, shared values and goals. Well, I think I think it's it's uh, precisely that the uh, these these agreements um, have uh, play multiple roles at the same time, and um, and and that's why it's also important to think about how how do we relate to them, how do we use them, and it's of course not only within the boundary of the agreement itself, but also in how um, we react to them. I think it's uh, um, it's uh, it's in interesting to see. Um, how sometimes we we don't manage to use um, um, uh, certain international agreements where it would be very possible to use them. For instance, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals yeah. uh, set forward by the UN. I think that is actually a very good framework to be used um, very much in relationship to policy development uh, all over the world. But you see that actually within the Netherlands, for instance, this is actually um, very hardly, hardly used as such. Um, and, and of course, that is actually a pity. It's also down to a question of how to operationalize this, uh, this kind of... Uh, exactly. So I, so I think it's interesting to see that it, there's numerous ways of, uh, of looking at it. And uh, yeah. but that's exactly what is the... Now, I think most of them are saying the same things, that this is more to set the right goals, to share the values, to set a benchmark, and to guide the whole planning process, addressing the global issues. But somebody has mentioned engagement. And maybe by end of today, we, I would really like to discuss this part, that these goals, how they are helping us to uh, discuss these goals with a broader audience, how we can actually implement it and how this can be more uh, informed and more people are being aware about it. So that can be a good discussion towards the end of the session today. So moving to the next first uh, part of the session, I would like to invite Caroline Nevian and Flip Tenkate. Maybe it, uh, it would be nice if everybody else uh, just switch off their videos and we have on screen Paul Gerritsen with Caroline Nevian and Flip Tenkate for the first panel con uh, discussion. Caroline Nevian is the Chief Science Officer at uh, Kementia Amsterdam, and she is also the Professor of Designing Urban Experience in University of Amsterdam and co-founder of WAG Societies. And a lot of uh, new projects and new uh, pioneer to new themes that she has been trying and testing last few years. So we are very excited to hear from you. And Flip Tenkate, he's the director of uh, Federatsi Rangtalik Qualitatai. And uh, he has previously worked as a journalist and also at the municipality of Amsterdam. So maybe, Flip, you can also tell us some stories from Amsterdam and that can be a good talk. 
Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Paul, I you take over from here now. I'll stop sharing the screen. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so, um, well, the first um, um, the first panel, we really would like to focus directly on this this idea of how uh, what's the role of this kind of uh, international agreements and uh, declarations in planning. And uh, I think it's important to understand that this, well, as I said, has multiple roles. Um, um, how to use that, how to make it useful uh, in the public sphere and how to organize societal groups and uh, stakeholders around that, both academically and, um, and also uh, in, in the public sphere and how, how, do, how we can uh, organize that. So maybe, maybe I would like to first uh, direct the first question uh, towards, uh, towards Flip. Um, your quest is really for uh, spatial quality um, and um, actually very often that uh, is mistaken for, uh, for keeping things as they are. Um, so um, agreements about um, monumental change um, actually may lead always to a less good environment and, uh, and of course um, um, yeah, I think we all understand uh, change will inevitably have spatial impact. How do you how do you cope with this? How do you relate to that? Um, how do you see this um, this uh, um, uh, uh, relationship? Yeah, I um, I was I am always uh, very very surprised when people say that uh, change and uh, new uh, developments um, uh, uh, are a problem for existing quality. Um, uh, the, in, in all the Dutch uh, um, uh, legislation and also the uh, national uh, vision on the on the future, they are saying we have to have a balance between um, uh, development and uh, protecting quality. But that's so such a, a, a strange uh, a difference. Uh, every development should enhance the quality. It's not a, a threat, but it's a it's a opportunity to to make the quality better. Uh, it's very strange that that in uh, uh, in in the views of of all those uh, policymakers, um, uh, new things are. Uh, uh, seen as a threat uh, to the quality. I, I think that's uh, uh, it's absurd. It's just a mistake. Um, nevertheless, um, if you reformulate it then the other way around, how could uh, international agreement like, for instance, the, uh, uh, um, the Paris Climate Agreement um, be used in your perspective in order to inform change in a, in a way that, that has this kind of positive quality. Uh, because in, the, in our current debate, well, you know as well as I do, that um, it's not perceived as, uh, as such um, in, uh, in just a national paper. Uh, you can read um, um, more stories about how effectively it will ruin our country uh, yeah. instead of that it will build uh, our country or put, push, push it forward. Yeah, I, I don't know where this uh, 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 conservative uh, view uh, comes from. Um, uh, maybe it has something to do with the uh, populist policy or, uh, 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 well, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, it can only be solved by uh, uh, presentation, pr presenting the, uh, the best uh, examples of um, uh, where uh, uh, all those new, uh, uh, well, you call you can call it threats, or all those new developments uh, uh, have a very great design, and uh, uh, and those examples exist uh, uh, a lot, but. Um, people don't know them. They only have the view uh, when we are uh, coping with the energy problem or the climate change, we have to build very high dikes and we have to make uh, those windmills uh, we detest and we have to make, uh, put all those solar panels on every rooftop. Um, 
but there's no, uh, 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 how do you call that, for building. Um, uh, imagination. Yeah, imagination. We have too, too, too little view on what might be possible. If yeah. we need uh, uh, designers to help us uh, uh, give those views. Okay, maybe, maybe Caroline, I, I would like to include you now in the conversation because I think it's, it's not only down to designers, it's also particularly down to how, uh, how, we, can, how we can inform this change in a positive way using uh, scientific research. That's particularly, particularly your role in the, uh, in, in the administration in Amsterdam to make sure that actually um, the city uh, benefits from all of the existing uh, research as, as best and as soon as possible. How do you see uh, the, the role of declarations and international agreements in that uh, particular role? Yeah. Well, the thing is that for, for a city and for city officials, uh, the, 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 the needs of every day are dominant. So I noticed in my colleagues, they find it rather strange that I spend any time on international affairs, you know, that I connect with Europe or networks or, you know, why would you spend time on other places while here we have so much trouble? So that's very dominant paradigm in many municipalities, very big paradigm. Mm. Um, second is that uh, the international agreements are, um, and I think we should make a distinction between the SDGs and the other agreements. Because the SDGs come out of the United Nations, which has been a 50-year structural collaboration between nations with all the problems, and the SDGs did not come from, fall from the air. They have been developed over 50 years. So the SDGs, they are so simple because it's 50 years of work mm. which is behind them. And I do think... Which makes them more fundamental than, for instance, the, the Paris uh, climate agreement. Which more easy to understand more uh, more integral over different domains. Paris sounds like a, 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 a arena for experts. It doesn't it doesn't sound like I am part of it. Well, SDGs is my life. It's about my life too. So I think SDGs do play a role in the city, as far as I can see with colleagues. Uh, also because they also resonate very deeply with a lot of values and and issues that we deal with day to day. And if we look at research, I think that um, um, it's very hard to speak about research as a general thing because we have alphabet and gamma, but we, in there we have so many different tribes and, and different cultures of research. Um, I think for some people, the research is very important uh, on, the, on, uh, on the climate agreements and things like that. But I also think that uh, as scientists, we have a problem that we don't know how to communicate about our work. And that has, is still today with COVID a very big problem. So as a researcher, of course, I deal with uncertainty. But policymakers cannot handle uh, the dealing with uncertainty. They always have to, you know, make clear that something is really the best solution. So um, this whole idea of how we deal with uncertainty from research and how we deal with uncertainty in policymaking or how we deal with uncertainty in our own lives is very hard. And then I think overall, I'm doing this, what you see behind me, this program Values for Survival in the context of the 17th Architectural Biennale. I'm the complementary research program to the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, representation there. Um, and what, one of the things that comes out of, the, out of this research program with a very diverse group of civil servants, uh, designers, artists, different kinds of scientists, natural scientists, social scientists, uh, and activists, not to forget, is that in this era where we are now, we have not, it's very hard to make the relation between the planning of my personal life in relation to the planning of my neighborhood or the planning of my city, let alone the planning of my country and of Europe. So the planning, even planning has become a, and also you are, this context where we are now is part of it, planning has become the job of experts. Well, I plan for my life, you know? And uh, 
uh, how do I as a citizen, what's my relation to the experts? So the experts should deal with the agreements because it's a, a, agreements of experts, so experts should then take them on. But uh, I don't understand the first experts. I don't understand the second expert. So mm -hmm. I'm, I feel excluded. And then they think of some participant that I am being participated. I feel that I am being participated. It's not my participation, you know? I'm being participated. I hate it. I don't want to participate. I plan my life. Of course, I want to contribute to my city. Of course, I want. But in a way that my responsibility and my accountability is taken serious. Mm. And it usually isn't. Nor by researchers who always think that they know better than others. Quite shocking. Yeah, so all this living lab, the researcher is still in charge. As a participant, as a resident, as a person, I cannot change the conclusion of the researcher. I cannot even argue with him in public. I'm also so, not that opportunity. So what I'm saying is that the international agreements, most of them are the field of experts. They exclude us. So in the best uh, of all worlds, they resonate with our val values, the values of justice, of compassion, of respect for life, of how we love each other, you know, how we take care of children. And the SDGs are doing that. But they come out of 50 years of misery of international collaboration. But at the same time, you see that, that the SDGs in the Dutch context, I always find it quite amazing, actually play very little role. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that the Paris Climate Agreement in just in general public is much more well known than the, than the SDGs. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know. You, you don't think so? Well, it depends probably on the circle where you are. <laughs> okay. I, don't know. I have no idea. I, I mean, in my perception, the SDGs are... I mean, I also did, for example, with students, I work with SDGs and I, I work with students on international agreements as well. SDGs, everybody understands. Yeah, because they're so basic. Uh, and they're, going basic they're about housing, they're about safety, they're about poverty, they're about climate. I mean, we understand them. They relate yeah. to my life. Okay. So, Flip, how do you see this? So, basically, uh, what Caroline is saying is actually, actually these agreements play a very important role with the experts, but that there is a big gap with, uh, with the rest of society, and it's very difficult to, to make them uh, useful in daily life. Uh, actually, uh, most of them don't, uh, perhaps with the exception of the, uh, of the SDGs. Uh, how, how do you look at that? Um, I, I think the, uh, uh, what Carolina said was, was very important. Um, how do you recognize in your daily life uh, uh, the values that are put down in those uh, international visions and uh, agreements. Um, uh, my experience is that um, debating on the, on the level of values uh, with citizens, with experts, they can reach out to each other and understand each other on value level. But when it comes to uh, personal interest, uh, there's a difference, and um, uh, in the participation process, um, people think they are talk. They should talk about their interests and not about the values. But you should start with the values, and then come to relating your personal interest to this uh, uh, value level. It's. Do you have a good example of of, uh, of such a process? Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's very often uh, take our uh, uh, the members of our federation are the uh, committees in every municipality that evaluate and uh, uh, ha have a role in a, in a local panel of evaluation of um, uh, housing and building building schemes on the aesthetics and when you um, talk about the values of, of, of a neighborhood, the um, uh, uh, historical values. People understand what, you, what you're saying and they understand that they have to re relate to those historical values. Um, even if, it, if it's not directly in their interest to do it. So um, when you agree upon the values, you can better um, uh, understand each other on the uh, 
personal interest level. And you can uh, put those interests in relation to the values. Mm -hmm. well, um, can I comment with a bad example? I mean, I really appreciate what you say, but I have also an example in Amsterdam where the people and the politicians agree about the values. So this is the value about biodiversity in the neighborhood, making a food forest. So there's great agreement on the values that we need to do this. <coughs> Here we are confronted with Naomi Klein. I don't know who he said the wrong people in the wrong place. There's this community of 50 people making this food forest, but the gardeners of the city, they have mowed it down 55 times now. Five, five, yeah, 55 times. That's not an incident anymore, yeah? It's not an incident. You don't do, by accident, you can mow once, yeah? But not 55 times. So there's also a force that is not interested in those agreements or values. They're just interested in their own money. This is about large contracts of mowing big spaces of land. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, there, so you need, with values, you need also uh, justice. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's um, uh, what I was coming to. It's very difficult for policymakers to, um, uh, to implement those values in the uh, regulations and the policies. And it's almost uh, impossible. Um, Why? Uh, when, you, when you speak about aesthetics, it's not, it's, it's, uh, um, you, you, should, you should try to reach aesthetics, but it's not measurable it's not um uh, you, you can't say well you've succeeded no you have done your utmost and that's enough uh, but uh, so we should uh, not have regulations or um uh, 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 laws or or uh, but but it should be in the process in the process of meeting each other in the uh, you should um when we are talking about spatial quality, you should not say we will um, measure if the spatial quality is enough. No, you should say uh, thou hast to talk about it. It must be an issue uh, in every scheme, in every project. You should talk about uh, how to um, better the spatial quality mm. uh, and not measure if it's done only measure if uh, if the process is uh, uh, all right. Caroline, how do you see that? Is 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 uh, is it difficult to uh, to anchor um, uh, values in in policy and, and particularly in executing this uh, policy? Well, I know so many examples where it goes wrong because mm. um, so I I am inclined to speak like like flip. So if I talk about the world of good people. We don't need regulation, we talk to each other and we decide how we do it and then everything will be fine, you know, and we all, we all give everybody a voice. The thing is that there is a huge money interest in a city. If I look at Amsterdam, there is so much financial interest and, uh, I, and also beyond the understanding of most civil servants even. Yeah. So there's, a, there's different problems. There's one problem about the data, and we don't know the data, nor the financial data, nor the eco data. We don't know most of the data as a city. So Google and, and so know more, but also the banks know much more about what happens in the city than the municipality does. Mm -hmm. So that's a very big issue, that as a municipality you don't have the data. Then the way we structure our data creates inequality, creates... Uh, uh, abuse of power, uh, permits it at least. Like for example, we talk about participation and citizens doing things we, in the database of you know, all the assets of the city. There is not a column where you can tick the thing, this is self-governed piece of city or self-governed piece of housing. So even, you know, we can have a value of participation, but our uh, the bureaucracy is not, doesn't know how to deal with participation. We mm -hmm. don't know how to do it. Or aesthetics for that world. You know, those are all values that if you can't measure them, they don't count. But also the way we do measure often doesn't even work. So, so there's a lot of, of things standing in between that. That's actually quite a bleak 
picture you paint and um, maybe uh, quite along the line of what Naomi Klein says uh, in her book, this changes everything, which basically says we, we need to change our complete understanding of, of the way uh, we built up our, uh, this world. The money, um, uh, economic interests, the vested interests are, are very much there, but it's also a little bit uh, the ignorance, the inability to, to use uh, insights, uh, data, uh, and, and also the structure of the data, which sort of doesn't help. Uh, I was hoping you would say, but I also have very good examples where it can be done in a proper way. Um, yes, yes, yes. Of course, of can course. You help? Yes, they are there. Yes, of course they are there. They are there, definitely. And also you see in the long run, yeah, um, that things get better. But for me, it's strange. I'm an, old, I'm an older person than most of you. So I remember very well the 80s, where there was a lot of self-governance and a lot of invention in how you could, you know, build housing with groups and energy and all that. And that's all being reinvented now after 30 years of super raw, uh, invasive uh, neoliberalism, capitalism. So all those things have been thrown into the bucket because of some people getting very rich, uh, rich beyond, uh, beyond uh, understanding. So uh, yes, it's possible, but I do think, and also in Amsterdam, there are different, you know, little groups of people who are smart and who have some architects and who know how to play the planning paradigm and they do their own thing. And we have a lot of subcultures where people do their own thing. But I really think that as a bureaucracy, I mean, there is a creative bureaucracy festival soon uh, in, in a few weeks. Uh, Charles Landry wrote his book, Bu Creative mm -hmm. Bureaucracy. So bureaucracies are extremely important. They are a weapon against dictatorship, but they're also a weapon against change. They're also, uh, they can be played by experts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, Kurosawa made this beautiful film, Ikuru. I don't know if everyone has, ever, anyone has seen it. It's about a civil servant who just wants to get a little playground working. Yeah, just one little playground. Uh, it's beautiful, it's just one, picture of civil servants. And I have many colleagues who do their best and I'm very proud, Amsterdam, for example, embraced circular economy with mm -hmm. Kate Rayworth. We start 200 projects, very great. We have a lot of innovation in IT. We do a lot of innovation in some neighborhoods with energy and all that. Yeah. So that's true. We have all these, you know, little diamonds. But I feel for the next decade, if we want to make it, we need a different attitude in municipalities. We really do. In that respect, I, th I think it's interesting what you told me is that actually uh, in quite a lot of uh, cities in Europe, uh, it, it will be interesting to connect to them even, uh, are uh, people with similar roles as, as your own, uh, often with different titles, but, but basically coming down to the same idea of, of shortcutting uh, uh, scientific knowledge, making prep preparing thing in, in uh, preparing it in such a way that, that it can be made useful for the, for the bureaucracies um, and how this can, can be effectively implemented. Can, can you tell me a little bit about, about what, what is happening uh, over there? You're connecting with them and what kind of agenda is coming out of that? Yeah, so, so uh, cities are, I mean, all the big challenges of our time I come down to the cities. 75% yeah? of us live in cities in Europe. And uh, cities don't know how to do the energy transition. I mean, there are so many problems, we don't know how to do them. So what you see is that not only in Amsterdam, there is now, I'm the first city science officer, but this is also happening in cities in Europe. So together with people from the commission, from GRC and RTD, I invited 20 cities, people in my role to come together. And then we came to Brussels and to Amsterdam. And this is quite amazing because this group had immediate consensus on very big issues. And that was so nice to see that apparently, uh, in the Dutch you have the expression, the wall is countering the ship. Uh, so the challenges are now so vast that the municipalities don't know how to do it. So they reach out to research. And in the combination of the two, people expect a lot of things to happen. So we agree that governance and finance is a very big issue. We agree that learning and communication is a very big issue. And we agree that the agency of the city is a very big issue. 
So cities are very low in the, they're called the lower governing, governing bodies. Well, actually they are the highest impact. Yeah. So we're not at the table while it happens in the cities. Yeah. And now these 30 cities have now become 35 cities. And we are now writing this report for the commissioners where we say we, as cities, we need our own interface to the commission. So if we talk energy transition, we need a special research group that works for cities and energy transition. Yeah, yeah. Also for the universities, very hard because they have very different formats. So we have different formats and all that. But it's a sign of the time that just alone in your own you know, bureau, you can't fix it. And the world will come to you if you don't go to the world. Yeah. And so it's very interesting to see that this development is happening. Uh, different, a lot of the commissions, uh, DGs, they're all participating. A lot of the networks are participating now. And we really hope to, to develop city science as a place where the challenges of the city are the start of the research agenda. And the city guides the research, is part of the research all the way through. Yeah. including choosing the methodologies, including validation, including different ways of publication. And what's interesting, we all agree that this marriage between science and policy can only happen when design enters the table. Because research finds out how it is, policy chooses what to do. In between, you have to develop options and scenarios and, and different ideas of services, how you can actually make these outcomes also in a such a way that I can enjoy them as a resident of a city or as yeah. an entrepreneur or whatever. Okay, so thank you very much for the, and also very inspiring. I think time for an uh, almost an international agreement about uh, about that, uh, at least uh, within uh, within yeah. Europe, uh, um, to make it more public. Um, with that last remark of the importance of design, I think Flip, uh, maybe uh, before wrapping up, um, um, you feel very comfortable, uh, I, I believe, in the role of design in this process. Uh, I can imagine that, that you find that uh, also you agree with that. Uh, but I would like to direct the last question towards actually something else uh, in the beginning of the year, just before um, the corona uh, uh, virus really got hold of the Netherlands. Um, maybe actually a little bit after, uh, without us knowing, on the 5th of March. Uh, we, we had a, a, a big meeting organized uh, by your organization um, um, making the, uh, the step between the international uh, DAVO declaration towards the Netherlands. Like how can we use that international declaration in order to implement this, uh, this focus on spatial quality in, in the Netherlands? But also there, um, there was a, a, a lot of focus of including civil society in this process. Can you say something about, about that uh, step still? Yeah, um, uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I, I think it was very urgent to have this uh, meeting because we are really in need of searching for new arrangements between um, uh, professional uh, uh, market oriented um, uh, building uh, uh, organizations, the commons in, in the society, uh, the, the uh, role of the government and uh, uh, the individual uh, uh, citizen. Um, uh, in fact, uh, when you look at the new policy uh, for uh, uh, and spatial uh, uh, organization, the Omgevingswet, um, uh, this new law um, has uh, uh, very much um, uh, ambition in the, in the policy, but when it comes to instrumenting, it's a, a very bleak. Uh, and in fact, it says um, uh, all those ambitions we have, uh, it's one of the main goals is to enhance the uh, quality of the environment. Uh, but there is no instrumentation at all in, in, in this law. In fact, it says society should do it itself. But then we have to make new arrangements between government, society, uh, the commons as, as, as uh, groups of people uh, with, with common interests and the individual to take it up. And we should um, 
uh, search for those new ar arrangements. Uh, we don't have them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be uh, 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 essential in how we um, make this planning uh, process in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, in the future. Yeah. yeah. Good. And how so. To how to protect the people who are not strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, can I add some quick thing with Flick? Yeah. Uh, because I had a question about the similar thing. Uh, Caroline mentioned towards the beginning that UN SDGs are much more integ integral, integrally included in the society than or easy, easy to understand than the Paris Climate Agreement. So what would uh, flip, because you are working a lot towards this Davo Declaration, how can, we, how can you compare that to, like, do you think that is equally informed about or people are more integrated with this declaration or do they feel that they are being, uh, they have that responsibility towards it? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, uh, that's why we organized this meeting. Uh, this Devo declaration was already undersigned two years ago and nobody ever heard about it. Uh, uh, and it's really very important what it's uh, uh, stated and uh, our governments uh, undersigned it and all the European uh, governments did. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> nobody ever heard about it. So uh, I think it was, it, it's very important to put it on the agenda and it's important for our work as a, uh, to, to legitimize what we do, in fact. Um, uh, but it will never have this impact, uh, uh, especially for the individuals as the, the, as the uh, SDGs uh, have. Yes. Yeah. And one more thing Carolyn mentioned, which is really interesting. And Terry has been, Terry Van Dyke from University of Groningen, he has been putting it already in the chat box. I don't know if he's there right now or not. Carolyn uh, mentioned that planning is becoming a job of experts. So what is the role of the citizens with the, in relation with these agreements? Like this is becoming detached. We are actually developing something similar to this discussion with Terry and Annette. I don't know if, uh, Terry, are you there in the call? Yes, I am. Thank yes. you. Maybe you can give us a short, brief idea about this boundary spanning of planners and uh, how planners and designers and uh, what can be the role. Yeah, sure. So there will be a session on October 2 where we explore a bit more on what should the planning and the planner be then um, in the future, what it is, what it feels to be now. And in this discussion, we also hear that planning has become um, distant as science driven and I would also say very problem driven. Whereas in the past, planning was about imagination and about ambition and about opportunities like Flip was also saying. And this fear against change and this fear for spatial quality is a really strange uh, twist of mind. We, and we're already seeing a lot of examples in, in a lot of countries where amazingly enriching, empowering investments have been done in the, in the public uh, space in cities. And why don't we see the agendas of the future also as ways to structure and enrich uh, spatial change instead of being fearful for them and installing a system that's mainly managed, uh, uh, managing risks and yes, as um, uh, Caroline is saying, these risks are there because of the power of really big organization, uh, organizations and entities. But we, we should go back to uh, uh, getting things together, uh, um, uh, drafting, promising outlooks to the future instead of bleak and con uh, concerning and unsettling problem statements. And that's what we're going to explore on October 2, where, where we will see wh wh what should a, a planning be and what should a planner do in, uh, in, in, in the face of the big uh, challenges slash opportunities of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I work a lot with students and one of the hardest things these days is to enter into the field of imagination with the students. 
Yeah, absolutely. Our world have taken, has taken away so much imagination of our youth. Yeah. Yeah. I have to work very hard as a teacher to get them out of the little app and the yeah. website yeah. and the Instagram and the, 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 to really think out of the box. It's very hard. They're consumers, not creators. Yeah, they have not been trained and they use the formats to fit themselves into formats. Yeah. Well, it's I a, was hoping to, to end a little bit on a positive note, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, you could there. say there's work to be done. Huh? Uh, so, so in that respect, but I, I do think also what, uh, what Carolina mentioned, that it's actually the capacity of planning in all of us. Huh? Like, how can, we, how, can we, how can we do that? How can we organize that? It's a very challenging thought, which we... Uh, want to explore uh, the 2nd of October further. For now, I would like to uh, thank yeah. Flip and uh, Caroline uh, for this first uh, session, and uh, maybe I give the word back to, to Alan Grisat just shortly. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Carolina and Flip. Uh, we, uh, it was really inspiring, and there are some other questions also coming in from Jasper from BNA. He's asking about uh, the financing part of it. That how can it be? How can the designs be realized and scaled up if it, they are not being financed properly? So the economic part with the sustainability goals also comes into picture. But I'm hoping that we discuss about these things more in the breakout rooms. Uh, now we have to move to the second panel due to lack of time, and I'm I can already see Martina coming in. Uh, welcome Martina Hausmanns and uh, I welcome Marcia van der Vloek. Uh, Martina Hausmann is an engineer, urban planner and the wet founder of uh, spatial order and mobility and services uh, in the city of Delft. And she has also worked before for the Den Haag municipality and Leiden municipality and also for Ministry of Internal Affairs. So welcome Martina. Uh, for the second panel, and I also introduce uh, Marcia van der Vloek. She has also studied in Tudel, so I can see a lot of academic professional relation over here in the discussion. Uh, and she has uh, studied with uh, technology policy and management, and now she has been working for last three years as a coordinator of spatial development in interna uh, uh, at the Ministry of interior and kingdom relations and before that she has also worked in with uh, infrastructure and the environment and right now if i'm not wrong she is the specialized uh, person for the international relation from the dutch agendas towards this declarations and agreements floor is your paul uh good luck with the second panel Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, I think there's a lot to, to take up from the first uh, yes. panel um, forward. Um, um, although I would like to shift the attention a little bit, we, we already did basically in our conversation towards the role of the importance of, of values. Uh, but I would also like to, to, to talk a little bit about, uh, about the operational side uh, of, of things, like how do in practice um, international agreements and declarations play a role in in, uh, in informing change. For instance, on the level of a municipality, um, how how do you uh, really create uh, change uh, in uh, um, let's say with the boots on the ground? Um, and uh, of course, I cannot uh, leave out the subject of the importance of the uh, Technical University of of Delft, since it's uh, it is in Delft. Uh, you've both have studied in Delft, you're both uh, engineers, uh, so, so engineers, so, so basically I think that's also an important role, eh? like the capacity of thinking uh, about problem solving, but also in terms of just hands-on uh, trying it out. Um, so maybe first I would like to, to go to uh, Martina Huismans, also a member of the board, by the way, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the Delta Metropolis Association. So um, very nice that you could, uh, could join uh, this afternoon. Um, how do you see this relationship between these international declarations and uh, real change on the ground with citizens, for instance, in Delft? Um, as you've heard from uh, Carolina, she was quite... Um, not quite positive about the role in this. It's, it's much more in the sphere of, uh, of professionals um, that this plays a role, but not so much um, for citizens. Do you agree? 
Um, well, she, uh, she discussed a lot of uh, very interesting uh, subjects, uh, but I will uh, focus on how I see it from the city of Delft, because in Delft we try to, uh, we're only a city of about 100,000 inhabitants, so it's not as large as Amsterdam. And uh, because of our scale, we always have to find um, all kinds of networks uh, to make sure that our solutions are, uh, are well, doable. And that makes that uh, we are often uh, open and uh, we can't um, make our, our policy makers, for instance, they always have to find uh, networks, lobby, uh, find connections to make sure that the goals that we set as a city are doable. So that, this may be a bit different from uh, the city of Amsterdam when, where there's a large democracy uh, power um, and well, for, for Delft, for example, uh, I think we have a tenth of the number of uh, uh, offices of policymakers. Uh, so maybe that's easier to discuss. For example, I see a lot of my uh, policymakers on quite a, uh, well, several times a, a month. And we discuss, for example, uh, mobility because mobility is one of my subjects. Uh, it's very important now uh, with all this CO, uh, the CO, the carbon dioxide reduction, uh, how to make plans to realize this. So um, in that uh, uh, point, we have had a lot of discussions of you have these goals, uh, their percentages, their uh, time scales, sometimes uh, 2050, 2030, and how to make it uh, doable for the next coming years. I mean, as an elderman, uh, it's only four years that you will be in office. And after four years, you have to show some of your, uh, of your successes and how to come to these successes in only four years. So that's really a difficult thing uh, if you look at it from the uh, polit politic way uh, of thinking. Uh, but if you look at it as uh, the more engineer way of thinking, the more technical way of thinking, uh, four years is just a small amount of time to make a change. So uh, it's always about uh, how to get in the right direction and take little steps, but also uh, make sure that uh, the goals that you set and that are often quite difficult uh, to make uh, concrete in the, in the short term, how to work on these. So that's uh, what we uh, discuss a lot about here in Delft and where we also use uh, the thinking force uh, of the uh, university we have uh, on how to, um, well, make sure that you can show something that's changing, but on the other side, not uh, just have some decorations uh, here and there, like, you, you know, like, uh, uh, like you are uh, decorating a Christmas tree, but that you really have something that makes the change. And I think that a lot of my colleagues in other uh, municipalities, they uh, struggle to find people to, on the one side, work on these concrete examples and make little changes. And on the other side, set policies that will take 10, 15 years to, uh, to make the change. But, um, well, that's the thing about scale and time that's quite difficult for, for a city. Yeah. So actually, the position of Delft is quite unique in that respect. Mm -hmm. It has a certain capacity because of the sort of um, uh, inhabitants it, uh, it has. Um, mm -hmm. uh, very often uh, they, they are attached somehow to the university, have studied there uh, previous times or, uh, uh, or are still studying there. It's quite a large population of students also. But at the same time, Delft is in between uh, The Hague and Rotterdam, much larger cities, but also very much aware that basically to to create some change you need this kind of cooperation on a on a bigger scale on a higher level so that kind of capacity of wanting to change something mm -hmm. um have learned that previously but also are in the middle of these two large cities and maybe even um and um not only symbolically but literally uh, spanning between these two cities and, and also uh, allowing for other municipalities to, uh, uh, to, to cooperate. To work with. Yes, and, and that is a feature that's uh, for, uh, for me as an elderman and my colleagues, um, where almost all of our, us are engineers, and that's quite different from most of our colleagues in, in, uh, here in the region. Um, so we uh, are used to think in what is possible now, what is possible in the near future, how about 10, 15, 20 years, will it still be a good solution? Because 
Uh, for example, in uh, the kind of dwellings we are building these days, uh, there are many discussions about whether these are the sustainable solution for the future. And like um, you were already discussing that uh, capitalism is one of the uh, difficult forces uh, when, when it comes to sustainability. And uh, there's a lot of discussions here in, uh, in our office. Are we doing the, the good things for the long term? Even though in the short term, it might uh, give us a lot of money and, and, and it will uh, ease some of the problems we now have with all the, uh, the, the finances in the city. But we are discussing it because we think for the long term, it might not work out a great way and we'll have a lot of expenses to do then. But it's difficult because on the pol politics side, uh, people think you're crazy not to choose the way to make the most money. Yeah. That's often a thing that we are discussing and that there are many uh, um, like maintenance of the, the public uh, uh, spaces, like maintenance of all kind of mobility uh, structures uh, for, for your car or for your bikes. Um, we can do the short uh, term thing that might be uh, easy and Caroline was already talking about that, that the way the democracy is working, it, it, it goes easily to that side. But on the other hand, you can also think of how, what about if we do uh, changes? But the thing is then, uh, you know, well, all of my uh, officers, they need to make uh, uh, mistakes to get to the right point. And that is often a thing that politicians don't really like when they have a democracy uh, that they're responsible for that they, when they are making mistakes. So yeah. um, you know, that is quite a difficult thing, but the, the, um, the nearby university helps us to talk about these things and to be aware that you have different ways of thinking about it. Yeah. But still, yeah, yeah the politic, polit uh, politics of every day is uh, quite a big thing to, um, <laughs> to handle then. <laughs> Yeah, well, so in a way you're, you're answering the question of, of Carolina or, or, or the statement of Carolina that, that actually the declarations is very much a, 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 a there for, as a role for, for the professionals. Um, uh, but it's also almost uh, impossible for you to answer since so many of uh, the inhabitants of, uh, of Delft itself are actually in this professional sphere by nature somehow. So that, that, that is a, a, a quite a unique uh, uh, position. So it's also uh, interesting to see how we, how we should continue this conversation with, uh, with other eldermen perhaps uh, elsewhere in, uh, in, in the network. Uh, I would like uh, now to uh, have uh, uh, Marcia van der Vlucht uh, uh, um, uh, getting into the conversation. Uh, since you're very much from this um, um, Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, res responsible for the international uh, relationship where it concerns spatial development, um, I think you're very much uh, in place to understand how this actually uh, would uh, need to work this kind of uh, agenda setting internationally and then how that trickles down uh, into real action uh, uh, with boots on the ground. Am I right? Well, I don't know if I have the answer actually because I don't know how it's supposed to work. I just know how we're trying to make it work sometimes. Um, of course, it, it's always uh, twofold. We're trying to see our own problems within the Netherlands and see what the goals are and see how we can get that back into the international agendas. For instance, for the Netherlands, when looking at energy transition, um, literally space is a problem. We're a small country, we're a dense country, we don't have a lot of space and other countries might have. So cooperation within the agenda and making sure that the other countries understand that your focus might be a bit different because space is a problem when looking at the energy transition. So that's, you know, getting your own problems into the picture of the international agendas. Uh, but it's also the other way around, of course. Uh, we have the international agendas, which uh, the Netherlands uh, commits itself to. So how do you get those into your own uh, spatial vision? Um, but also how do you help, for instance, local uh, municipalities like Delft uh, to get a hands-on feeling of what that means? And in, in a previous job, I worked for the Delta program uh, as a program manager for the incentive program for spatial adaptation. And when you look at one of the things that was done in the Delta program, namely translating 
uh, all the data that was in European context, um, well, gained actually with, with European uh, money, uh, with uh, uh, research programs, but it was put into the Climate Effect Atlas, which was actually trying to make it in a sort of user interface to talk in engineers terms to make it easier for municipalities and little places to see okay so what does that actually mean what does all this data mean how can i actually react to it so making a clear sort of map and atlas and seeing okay what's the problem where i live is it a heat spot is it a water problem is it so you, you i think your goal is to um, work together on gaining da data, work together on looking at the, the common goals, work together on uh, finding uh, common problems like we do in the urban agenda for the EU. Uh, but also as a Dutch government, try to make the translation between the problems we get from different municipalities uh, and the other way around, trying to help them with, okay, we have all this, but how can they use it? And we do that in different programs. Uh, we do that for spatial planning within the ESPON program, trying to get concrete instruments for, for local uh, policymakers. But as I said, I don't have the answer. I don't know how it's supposed to work. I just know what we're trying to do to get it into more concrete steps. Yeah. So basically, you're saying it 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 works both ways. Eh? So it's it's also setting problems seen by Dutch municipalities, Dutch citizens, Dutch uh, circumstances on the international agenda, um, and at the same time, the other way around from the agreements. Um, how do we implement it? Uh, how do we cooperate within the Netherlands to reach these kind of uh, agreements. I think it's interesting that you mentioned something that uh, Carolina also pointed towards, that uh, actually uh, the importance of, uh, of making data useful, um, making data informative, which is a huge challenge. And indeed, uh, it's, it's somewhat um, positive uh, experiences within the Delta program, but but still a lot to be uh, developed uh, in, in that respect. And that is actually very fundamental in, in, in informing real change so that we can understand where, where's the problem at and, and actually have participation in, in that. Uh, Martina, do you agree with that, uh, with, with that last point? Have you have, uh, have had experience with that in, uh, in the Delft uh, circumstances? Um, well, for example, in uh, Delft, but also in uh, the, the whole uh, metropole of Delft, uh, the Hague, of the Rotterdam, the Hague, uh, we're working on a, a, a CO2 uh, the reduction uh, in uh, mobility. And uh, it's quite easy to uh, make up a list of, or a menu with all kinds of things that you could do to uh, reduce uh, the levels. But then you have to uh, switch to uh, the way to implement these projects that are uh, told. And the thing is that a lot of the municipalities find it very difficult to translate them to their local, local needs and their local issues, local context. And for example, uh, if you talk about, uh, um, well, making biking and cycling more uh, interesting and the use of cars uh, less interesting, there are several ways to work on that. But for the city of Delft, it's easier to uh, say, well, you can park your car here or uh, you can ride your car in this street. For other uh, municipalities, that's quite difficult. But then uh, the goals are set on a regional scale and uh, they all sound quite okay. And, but once you get to the level of the municipalities, it's sometimes very difficult to, uh, to set that aim. And where Delft just says, okay, we're going to do it here and it will start then. Uh, other municipalities will just it will take maybe it take maybe ten years before they can implement some, such a quite an effective uh, uh, plan, and that goes down with all kind of uh, uh, mobility uh, uh, changes. That uh, you're very uh, very much depending on the kind of municipality where the changes have to be made. So uh, from the uh, view from a national uh, national government, it's like well the region can work on this, but the region just really doesn't exist. So uh, I think, uh, and then you can make a toolkit and you can make all kind of uh, uh, easy to implement ways to do things. 
but uh, on the local scale, you sometimes meet a lot of di differences that makes it really difficult, for example, for politicians to make the right decisions, even though it should be doable. But uh, then it's maybe a bit too abstract or maybe a bit too, um, well, it, it's, it's quite difficult to make it in a certain uh, poli uh, political uh, environment uh, to the next step. And that's often not measured in all the, uh, the ways the plans are made. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's, but because of the decision making and the money that's needed that has to come from the city council, it's a very difficult level to, to cross them. Yeah, okay, so it will be interesting to hear something from Marcia about it, but first, still a question about that, because basically, do you feel then, in the end, that uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, monumental, uh, uh, very abstract, global, international agreements, do they then finally help in this process, or is it actually the other way around? Would it be much more um, profitable or doable if, if it if the incentives come, comes much more from the local scale and then adds up uh, upwards towards uh, something of a communal uh, uh, goal? Or is that, yeah. is well, that kind well, of uh, stick uh, from this kind of international agreement, is that important in order to, to push things forward? Well, to start with uh, this uh, carbon dioxide reduction, it was good to say, well, we have to have uh, a reduction of 30% for that and that uh, date. But uh, once we had to um, translate it to a doable uh, plans for uh, the, the different uh, municipalities, it's now more about uh, a sustainable city, about a nice environment to live, about a livable city, about the healthy city, and it's no longer about reduction of carbon dioxide. So mm -hmm. uh, once we got rid of that bit, and it's it's a quite an important goal if you look at it globally or uh, uh, national, but uh, to make it more doable for all these elements that have to find the money and have to go to the next step to do all these uh, projects, it's not now about health because health is what people understand and what they like. And especially in uh, the beginning of the Corona time, uh, there were just a few cars on the street and uh, the sky was blue because there were no uh, planes. And that made uh, visible what uh, a life, uh, a livable and healthy city could look like. So we now uh, transformed uh, this CO2 uh, uh, reduction to uh, uh, healthy cities. And now it's much more easy for uh, the different elder men to work on it. So you have to find a way to make it the story acceptable. Yeah, so in that respect, also something coming from the first conversation that it's very important to to have values that are meaningful to citizens. And, uh, yeah. And, 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 yeah, just what Karlin told us, Ned. Yeah, yeah, and then there is a role in, in, the, in the municipality in translating this, making this translation uh, uh, from this kind of international uh, abstract agreement towards something yes. that's meaningful for, uh, for citizens. So, uh, yes. Marcia, are you aware of that? Are you, are you seeing it in, in similar ways? Well, of course I am. I mean, uh, the whole, what you have within the Netherlands that locally is different from regionally is different from nationally. We also get that within Europe. We always say territory matters. It's completely different living in mountains than it is living in the Netherlands, uh, even though you all need the same uh, healthy, sustainable, uh, livable cities. Um, but that's why I always say it's so important to actually be able to translate and also be able to work together with, with uh, for instance, again, the urban agenda. There's these different working groups of cities that experience the same problems. It's, it's not that everybody has to uh, be in a working group, but if you experience a certain problem, uh, you can work together with different cities within Europe and find common problems and, and share solutions and share knowledge. Yeah. Um, and even within the Netherlands, we are talking about municipalities, but there's also regions within the Netherlands that have different problems because they're not cities, uh, as we call them, cities within the Netherlands. And even if you look at that, I mean, uh, the Netherlands is completely different from a metropolitan area like London or Paris. So. Um, Territory matters and solutions are not all viable. There's not the one solution. And, and that's uh, what I mean when saying we have to try to 
make a translation from these global goals towards, okay, but what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the Netherlands when it comes to space, when it comes to energy transition, but also when we look at the Netherlands again, uh, what do we do within certain regions? And even if we have, as, as, as Martina said, uh, a goal uh, in, in the Regio Haaglander, what does that mean for Delft? Because Delft is, Delft is again different. Um, so yeah, that's, and that's what I meant by it's always twofold. Um, we sh and that's why I said it's more about cooperation and sharing knowledge and, 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 and that's what I answered the first question yeah, yeah. about sharing and cooperation because we have, we, the, the goals are quite broadly declarated within these declarations. But the, what does that mean? And what does that mean for a certain person? And, and even though we, we, we talked about in the last couple of minutes in the previous session about uh, maybe people don't have imagination anymore and we have to keep in mind the people that cannot talk for themselves. That's all true. And, uh, but I try to be a bit more optimistic and, and uh, I have a child now going to, to the Design Academy in Eindhoven and I remember people coming from the Design Academy in Eindhoven and, and giving me solutions when I was still working for the Delta program. So I'm all optimistic about, you know, having people working together because when you bring it to a local level, you talk about people and you talk about your neighbor who I walk the dog for. And, and you know, it's, it's little things like that. You have to always, it's, I don't know the solution, but it's always about communicating and, and making it twofold and making it territorially sane, the solution, a viable solution for your local problem. Yeah, so very important the international exchange of ideas, the inspiration uh, also in, in that respect. But in the end, we still need to reach uh, certain goals and they need to add up. And, uh, and there's also a, a certain risk that while exchanging ideas, being uh, inspired and enthusiastic, we will not in the end uh, meet these goals. Uh, how, how do you see that? There is some sort of bookkeeping needing to be done, right? Or 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 how does that, how does that, how yeah, does that book, yeah, there is bookkeeping that needs to be done. Um, so there is certain rules you make, but you're, you don't um, over-regulate. Um, We've seen it, for instance, with, uh, with the nitrogen crisis at the moment. I think it's a very good example of how not being able to meet certain goals leads to a, a, a very almost um, surreal crisis uh, overnight, F uh, perceptibly, yeah. Eh? Not not for, not for the experts, but for 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 my next door neighbor. They, they really don't understand how this how this worked out. But it, it has a lot to do with with uh, with not being able to keep to uh, these international agreements. Yes, and that also has to do with uh, making sure that you know the differences within different regions because uh, that of course is very much a problem within the Netherlands where of course we again have a dense country but if we are also uh, the corridor from the harbour of Rotterdam towards uh, Ruhrgebiet and different areas so again this is, is uh, are we talking about um, what can we do? What are the solutions? And can we put it into rules? Or are we also talking about putting things into context and making sure that you know what it means? What is the territorial impact of the European rules, for instance? And spatial planning is not uh, uh, something Europe can do. It's, it's all the member states. It's spatial planning is of the member states. But of course, different rules we have within Europe for instance, on climate, have their effect on what you can do spatially. So that's why it's such a, again, a difficult uh, problem and making sure that, you know, what is the territorial impact? Are we doing enough territorial impact analysis? How can we do that? And what does it mean? And yes, uh, you're right. At this point, we have a problem with the European rules saying, okay, uh, you're, you're out of boundaries, fix this. And then of course, there's all these different areas within the Netherlands, again, where the problem is bigger or, or lesser. And sometimes it's more of a problem for, for building houses because we have a housing problem and somewhere it's more of a problem for farming. So it's, again, uh, the translation and making sure that you know 
uh, how these rules actually add up for your region. So yeah, no, they, I, I agree. We have to keep um, a certain bookkeeping, but I also think that if we overregulate and if we don't have attention for what it locally means, we have a problem. And even if we don't have attention for what it locally means, if you just look at rules, you might not find very good innovative solutions. Uh, can I ask one point here, Paul? Is it okay? Sure. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Is, are there also some questions in the chat or uh, is, yes. is that? Yes, there are okay. questions. I'll just take it up, but quickly just one point what Marcia was already talking about. So, of course, the global agreements needs to be translated in the Dutch agenda. And if I'm not wrong, that is somehow your role that you're playing uh, as a project manager of international relations. And what? yeah. In, for certain agendas, yes. So, uh, of course, for spatial, for the territorial agenda, which is yeah. a spatial uh, agenda, we try to translate these uh, agreements, the Paris Agreement, uh, the Green Deal. We are with the different uh, member states talking about what is the new territorial agenda after 2020, so the territorial agenda for 2030. What does it look like? How do we translate these uh, agendas into this territorial agenda? And we also do that for uh, uh, common uh, European research programs. Uh, how, what's the focus going to be? What's the goal of the program? What kind of pilots can we do within that? What research do we need? So for a certain part, because there's a lot, of course, a lot more. But yes, for a certain course, part within yeah. Europe, yes. Yeah, so then those uh, that after it is being translated in the Dutch agenda, it needs to somehow transfer in the local scale. So be it the regional scale, be it coming from the national scale, it needs to be transferred to the regional scale, the municipality scale and the local scale. Can you share uh, with us some, like, of course, you mentioned already that we don't want to regulate too much. But at the same time, are there any framework of guidelines or any uh, subsidies or any initiatives that uh, the local scale or the regional scale can follow for these to actually adapt these new agreements, actually adapt this. So this is, I'm asking you from very much from the ministry role. Well, of course we are, um, what we've tried to do is get these agreements translated into a national uh, uh, strategy for, for uh, spatial planning in the environment. So the, the Dutch version, the NOVI. Yeah. And if you look at the goals there, and if you look at some of the, 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 the aspects that are uh, uh, mentioned, they translate quite clearly into to some of the agreement goals. And um, we've also said it's, it's for the first time an agenda which, is, uh, which will be developed. Mm. Um, and we are also making regional agendas. Yeah. So, um, the NOVI is, first of all, not just nationally written down, it's in cooperation with the municipalities and the provinces. And uh, uh, what it clearly tries to do is say, OK, but this is the national goal, but we have different regions with different problems. So, um, yes, uh, Twente is different from Haaglander. So if we look at a, a, a regional agenda, the focus will be different. Yeah, yeah. Martina, do you want to comment uh, here something about, as an elder man from a city of Netherlands, what kind of expectations do you have from the national government or from the ministry to actually, like how they can help you in certain way to adapt these guidelines? Well, the thing is, it's not just uh, the internal affairs uh, that we have to work with as a city. Uh, there are many, uh, many ministries that work uh, with uh, several part of with difficult parts of uh, spatial planning, if you look at it, because you have uh, like mobility or uh, um, agriculture. These are different ministries. And uh, sometimes it's all already within a ministry difficult to um, to make sure that everything fits and that it's an, uh, an integral um, uh, plan that's worked on. Because for example, if you look at mobility and about 
uh, the way to reduce uh, this carbon dioxide. You have to not just work on the regulation and the short-term effects, but also on the structure of where are you living, where are you working, how long is the distance that you're uh, traveling each day, is it possible to work at home, uh, where do your uh, uh, children go to school, uh, where do you do your shopping, and that all will work to, re uh, to help to reduce uh, carbon dioxide. But this structure that's, that will be in the NOVI, uh, that's one of the things that is uh, difficult to talk about, for, for instance, with the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure. Yeah. And uh, they do have uh, schemes that are already planning for after 2030. And a lot of the uh, very important uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructures are already planned, but like uh, housing or maybe uh, working areas are still in development. And I think that uh, uh, Novi as an, an image of 2030, maybe 2040 is okay, but how to get there and the steps to be taken and what will be there first? Will it be the housing? Will it be uh, the public transport? Will it be uh, the cycling uh, tracks? Uh, we really have to think of how we are going to do that. And the thing is for, uh, for a bit, we will be uh, looking at the national government, but the provinces or for instance, the, the metropolitan region, uh, all these levels, all these uh, different scales are needed to make a coherent uh, a spatial plan and also a, a way to implement things. Because when you do it in a different order, uh, there might be uh, things going wrong because once people get into the car, they will never get out of it. Yeah. Uh, or it will be very hard and cost you a lot of money and time to uh, to operate. So, um, and I think the discussion about these uh, topics is often difficult because there are so many ministries involved and so many uh, offers who have different things about policies. Yeah. yeah so basically, the integration that is um, the starting point of the uh, national environmental vision still has to be um, delivered. Uh, from the different ministries working together on a level that is so integrated that you can do something. It's interesting to see in the chat that actually Fred Groepbloed, uh, who, whom you might know, Martina, from, uh, mm -hmm. from the Municipality of Leiden, uh, actually also mentioned that. Um, he, he says the national agenda is filtered by the province before it enters the municipal uh, dialogue. Um, hinting a little bit at, a, at maybe a, a, a problem eh? rather than thinking <laughs> well you, you have to do it together with the different skill levels it's it's it, 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 it suggests a certain distance that is uh, that is gained by having the uh, the provinces uh, in between uh, how, how do you feel uh, about that well i think uh for leiden the the situation is a bit different from what it is for for uh the, the, the metropole region here because Delft is part of the Rotterdam de Hague area and we do have our own uh, um, uh, mobility uh, uh, region and also our own finances and Leiden is part of the provinces and has to deal with that and one of the problems of the provinces is but it's my my own opinion it's not something that's uh, measurable but um, my opinion is that uh, the provinces want to do something for the cities but also for the smaller municipalities and because of that the money is just spread like it's some uh, some layer that has to uh, equally uh, be divided and um, when you look at the NOVI and the uh, very important uh, bits that have to be worked on, then you have to make uh, uh, decisions like uh, Leiden needs some extra money for this and oh, that's sorry for Alfa and Rijn, but they won't get money for this. But the thing is that everyone has to have an equal uh, share and that sometimes makes it difficult. And I can uh, imagine that filtering by the provinces might be uh, something like that because when you want to have uh, a very sustainable planning that it means that not everyone gets the same amount of money to do things. You have uh, very important uh, projects yet that you have to do now uh, and maybe part of projects that are not that important so but that's difficult no. because we do have some equality um, um, equal thinking uh, in the Netherlands that might be some not that helpful sometimes. So again actually uh, money coming in as, as a rather uh, hindrance than as something to create opportunity which of course it should do. Um, maybe as a last point uh, I also saw still a question from uh, Carolina uh, to, towards uh, Marcia. Uh, she asks uh, how do values play a role in, in your work at the ministry actually? Um, 
can you say something about that? So, so real core values, are they part um, of the discussion or is that... Well, I can, that already so much I can only uh, answer I can answer for me as a person um, of course yeah. and 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 when looking at my colleagues um, for instance the fourth national uh, report on the SDGs we put um, uh, sustainable um, urbanization as an agenda point within that and that's from working within um, always thinking, okay, uh, we're looking at the development of the Netherlands, we're looking at the cities, what do we want? We want it to be connected to what Martina said, people living there and, and going to work, etc. So I can't speak at that level because I'm at the ministry and I do European work. So sometimes it, for me, feels like it's all going, you know, high over and, and that's it. But when I work, I try to think from these values and try to translate that into, okay, I'm working on the SDG report now. What can I say about where we need to make connections? What's important? And, and that's what I do every day, trying to think from, well, making this world hopefully still livable for my grandchildren, which are hopefully coming soon because I've been telling my children to Give me grandchildren, no, but kidding. But honestly, <laughs> you try to do that within your work continuously, I think. But that's from a personal view. And um, when working at the ministry, I see that all around me. I mean, the things we write down, we do that because we value the, the international agreements. And the international agreements uh, actually get put into effect by, uh, as the Netherlands, working really hard to make a, an urban agenda for, for the EU. Yeah. So, yeah, it's continuously, yeah. for me, something that's there. But, yeah, maybe I'm just an optimist. Well, you need to be, I think, in your line of work. But um, uh, maybe as a last, uh, really last, uh, very last point, since we're all uh, engineers, uh, all having studied at TU Delft, do you feel it's an hindrance or, a, or actually a... Uh, a quality that you that you've studied uh, at, at Delft University. How, how, do you, how do you perceive that? Maybe also for Martina, but first Marcia. Um, well, I always say I studied the thing that was always the translation thing because I went to uh, system engineering, policy analysis, and management. So what they always taught me is um, you're like the Swiss knife. You can't do anything properly, but you know how it all works. And um, so up to now, it's been an advantage because I've always thought, okay, I know a little bit You're about special engineer. Is, and I know about, the, but I can actually make the trans translation towards politics and towards uh, agendas and towards my next door neighbor. Because um, that's what I've been taught to know just enough to make it into a story which can actually grab. And I kind of agree with, with Caroline there that the SDGs is something that people can grasp easily. Uh, mm. But I do hope that we can make the story uh, from the Paris Agreement, uh, maybe in 20 years, but we can make it uh, as, as, as grabbable for people as well. So. Okay, Mart Martina, also for you, I guess you're also a special kind of engineer. I remember when studying at the uh, at the Faculty of Architecture that we were never really regarded as, as real engineers? How, how do you look at that? Well, that was just the first thing that I was thinking when, when you asked me this, this question, because uh, we're not really the, the, the hardcore engineers, uh, like, uh, for example, the mechanical engineers or the, uh, the civil engineers, uh, but still the way of thinking that, that, that you uh, learned during your studies is that you uh, have an uh, analytical way of uh, looking at things and also an open mind that the solution that's most like, uh, likable to be your solution can often be uh, well dis disguised or can can look different from uh, what would really be necessary to do and uh, as a politician you're always looking for solutions that are easy to explain and everyone uh, hope well that will be the thing to do but sometimes there's a solution behind that one that's a bit more difficult to explain but might be uh, um, uh, better working for a longer term term and I now we often uh, notice that in our uh, uh, elder, with the eldermen that I'm working for here in the city uh, center is that we uh, 
uh, always looking for solutions that are not the first to think of. But uh, that's sometimes difficult to explain to uh, the municipality or to the uh, city council to understand. And um, well, sometimes they say that we're too abstract and too far away from reality. So we always have to uh, uh, be talking to the people of the city to, uh, to know what they really want and what, the, what they can understand. Because I really agree with uh, Caroline that you have to uh, make a goal that you're working on very accessible and very, uh, well, everyone needs to have a, a picture of it straight away. And if you have to explain it too much, then it's not a good goal to work on. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martina okay. Huismans, uh, Marcia van der Vlucht, both of you. Thank you very much for this conversation. Uh, back to you, uh, Alan Krieger. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, there are already other questions coming in in the chat, but uh, I think it would be better that we take a quick break and then we come back to uh, the breakout room sessions and with the presentations uh, at the beginning and then we take up these questions. So uh, let's come back in 10 minutes with a cup, cup of coffee and uh, please do not leave the meeting. Uh, just uh, switch off your audio and video and that should be fine. And uh, one other thing is we have already sent you the instructions for Miro board. So we are also testing and trying this. Please uh, try to quickly log in in the Miro board because after we come back, uh, we will talk about it more. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes.
Hey, is everyone back? I'm back. Great. Can everyone once maybe share their uh, faces with us, videos with us, so that we know that everybody is back? Perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Amrita, Amrita, I lost the, the gallery view. What do I need to do? Or is it with you? Oh, uh, uh, you can go to the gallery view, but I have shared the screen. Maybe that's the reason you are unable to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I will stop sharing now and then maybe you can try to see. Yeah. Does this work for you? You can see everybody now. There are a lot of non-video participants, so that's why we can just see some faces here. That's okay. So I'm just uh, checking Niels Drissen, are you there? Because we'll be starting with your presentation first. I'm here, yes. yes. Unfortunately, uh, Mark, my colleague, is not able to join, but... Um, oh. oh, that's a pity. Oh. I'll be doing the presentation on my own, that's okay. Okay, no, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so welcome yeah. back, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody got a short time to get a coffee or a tea or something. Um, but um, we start with the second, we are already running late, so we'll just try to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, so the next part of our session are the presentations. So we will have the first presentation about sustainable planning. And I would like to invite uh, Niels Drissen. He is a sustainable development consultant from Archidas Netherland. And uh, here we were also expecting Mark Binnenport, but uh, Niels mentioned that he's unable to join now. So uh, he'll be discussing about a super interesting model, how to implement sustainable projects, and uh, also showing us some examples of their work. You have 15 minutes time, Niels. Uh, do you want me to share your uh, presentation or do you want to sh share by yourself? I, I think, think that's okay if you uh, share it. And if I uh, could get control, then yes. I can go through the slides. That would be great. Yes. Uh, so I, I have already put you as a sharing option. So if you want, you can start that already. Uh, but are you going to share the slides? That would be better, I think. Okay, okay. Give me one minute, I'll do that. Maybe Neil should do it himself then, if, if it's not working. Yeah, no, I'm trying, but uh, it says some, the presentation is logged. So that's why I'm checking something. You can cancel that, I think. It's, uh, it has to do with a link, but you don't need a link. So you okay. can just cancel that uh, okay. notification. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Uh, this way I can keep my notes with me as well. That would be better for it. Sure. <clears throat> the part Mark was supposed to tell. And mm -hmm. then I can ask for remote control. Yes. Request. Yeah. I don't have the full screen, so if you are perfect. Everyone's seeing the full presentation now, right? Yes. And then hopefully I can click. To the next slide. Oh, oh, I'm going way too fast. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all uh, for um, uh, giving us some time to uh, uh, let us see our view, uh, view on uh, sustainable planning. So uh, we were asked to give our vision on sustainable uh, uh, sustainability and implementation on that part. Uh, we've had some great discussions already. Um, first challenge really came up like, okay, how do we get all those values together, uh, straighten them out and making policy of them to implement them. Uh, I think uh, I will discuss something about how uh, those values, whatever values are being put in policy can be implemented in projects. Because I think that's a, a quite different kind of uh, job to do as well, uh, where a lot of things go wrong uh, in our opinion. So my name is Niels Riese. I'm a sustainable development consultant. And well, I should do this uh, presentation together with Mark, Mark Binnenport, and he's a spatial planning and urban development consultant who works for uh, one of our projects, Krylo, which is our uh, main example in this uh, presentation. Um, so we can keep it practical, basically. So at first, I hope it's going to the next slide. Yeah, now it is. Arcadis, uh, I think a lot of you already know Arcadis. Um, it's a global design and consultancy company working for natural and uh, built assets. And uh, because we are global, we have a lot of experience in a lot of different cities, uh, which makes it uh, good for us to know uh, what kind of ways are used to implement sustainability goals. Um, yeah, and I think in that respect, I can uh, I tell you something about this. Um, so let's go to the next. At first, I would like to talk about our uh, main priorities when it comes to uh, urban areas. Um, so we see a couple of main priorities like maximizing mobility or integrating uh, transport systems, uh, expanding the resiliency of a city. So that's more about climate adaption where we, uh, we were talking about in this whole meeting, uh, creating systems that respond uh, to climate adaption. Uh, and uh, last one, encouraging regeneration. So making sure that uh, we can reuse our assets and uh, seeing potential in, in several assets that are there. Now, um, how do we actually see the city as a system? So, um, and can we actually see it as a, a plan that we can plan? Can we do something about that whole ecosystem? Um, and we see our system or we've come up with a, a pyramid model of that uh, city uh, where we can divide the city in several smart in several layers connected by uh, smart layers, as you can see. Um, and those smart layers are translating one layer to the other. Uh, and basically this is all because we would like to uh, see if uh, growing city, cities due to uh, urbanization, for instance, uh, still keep people uh, uh, well comfortable in their own in their own city. Uh, do they do they still uh, respect one another? Uh, and how do we maintain that whole connection between the city and its own inhabitants? And uh, those are the big questions that we relate to. Um, and in 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 main respect, we would like to. Uh, address like how do you uh, uh, translate those values into uh, uh, value things of this, uh, the city itself of the inhabitants. Well, this all starts with values and visions of the people and stakeholders who are involved. Uh, these need uh, to be in line with the second layer, which is the level of governance. We've been talking about that level a lot 
in this whole meeting, but also investment power and, and the decision makers uh, themselves. Um, that's the second layer. And then for the third, we need a extra step, a smart layer, we think, um, because when we, go, when we want to go to a system, so a system where we can discuss this whole uh, implementation of sustainability, we need uh, some kind of tool to discuss topics like um, like we've said before, like they are over there as well. Sometimes I need to switch. Like uh, mobility, housing, energy, uh, water, food. Those are the topics we would like to address and to discuss via that smart system. Um, and that's a system that we're going to talk about uh, in, uh, in the example that I'm going to show. And to make the set step from systems to resources, we need another smart layer. So when a system is created, in which we discuss our uh, values and visions, basically, uh, we need another smart layer to uh, come up with resources uh, which are feeding that system. Also uh, in the example that I'm going to show right now. So the project we're going to talk about today is Kylo. Uh, Kylo is a project uh, Mark has been uh, a project leader of uh, for many years now. It's a former military base uh, and it's becoming a sustainable neighborhood. So uh, Kylo is situated along the uh, highway A1 uh, next to the village of Bussum and uh, the Gooise Nature Reserve. It's about 40,000 square meters, uh, houses eventually 500 uh, it has 500 houses eventually, is the plan, uh, and around 5,000 square meters of business uh, use. Um, and it is part of three municipalities, which is quite interesting because they have to work together. So uh, three city councils are involved in this whole project. Then we come to uh, our system again. Uh, so the main theme in this whole approach was sustainability for this whole project. Uh, and we use the principle of this pyramid again to draft uh, a process based on values, systems and resources uh, to keep monitoring our choices and actions, basically. The next slide. So here we come to that first smart layer. And our starting point, or basically the vision, the, 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 the first part of the uh, pyramid, uh, was set up in an ambition document, which was uh, signed by the three uh, city councils. And we used to adapt versions of the methodology Sustainable Civil Structures, or in Dutch, the uh, KWW, to translate, and translate these, uh, these values and ambitions into different systems uh, to make them discussable and uh, measurable for most. Uh, and together they resulted in the Kylo sustainability wheel, uh, which was not only a guideline during the design process, but also a very strong element in our communication process. So really clear to our, uh, to the, the, the several stakeholders, but also uh, future and existing inhabitants around the area. And of course, then it's all about the communication. Uh, like uh, said before. Um, so major part of this whole communication process were four reoccurring sessions with approximately 80 participants, uh, a wide range of prof professional and non-professional uh, public and private stakeholders. And these sessions were super interactive, of course, um, and apart from public uh, support and the sharing of knowledge, these sessions resulted in two major design principles. At first, uh, comprehensive sustainability scenarios, so it needed to be comprehensive. And uh, the focus in our ambitions, which we'll see next. So in this whole discussion, we came up with four kind of um, concepts. Um, based on the input of all the stakeholders during these sessions, uh, those four uh, concepts were made. Uh, and in this case, a more natural versus conceptual approach on the vertical axis, collective or individual orientation on the horizontal axis. Uh, we're used to experiment with uh, those four corresponding urban designs. And these scenarios are also used in our environmental impact uh, assessment analysis at the end of the 
day you have to uh, get that paper done, of course. Um, let's go to the next. Here we'll talk about the concept itself. So, of course, sustainability is about making uh, choices and uh, the vision that has eventually been come up with, with the whole participation process is written down in, uh, firstly, the ambition document we talked about in the vision, uh, which helped us making those choices. But second, the session uh, with our stakeholders gave us the input to translate these ambitions into a supported sustainability concept. And um, the choice that we've made is that we are focusing on four major systems uh, leading into further development of biodiversity, energy and mobility. And together with these three systems, uh, you create a unique identity, which is what uh, future inhabitants really want it as well. And so during those sessions as well, a lot of creativity is, uh, is, is being explored or being expressed. Uh, so I think people are still really creative if you give them a platform to, to be creative. Um, and what I want to say about this is that um, uh, there were a lot of solutions uh, gathered and the ambition document set by the government, the scenarios uh, that they made themselves and the concept uh, or the choice on the four uh, different levels we wanted to focus uh, help us to clarify value and arrange these possibilities uh, in order to monitor uh, the cohesion of all the actions we developed uh, a second uh, tool, which is a qualitative sustainability dashboard. So when all the uh, ambitions are set in light green, you need to track them, which is your next step um, to secure them and see potential. And if not, if not secured yet, you need to adapt again during the process. And this dashboard shows us uh, what the ambitions are. Uh, basically, uh, and how to keep track of them. But how do you get to that yellow line? That's the next uh, step, of course, the whole monitoring phase. Um, and we've come up with a sheet of uh, one of those topics, energy being the first. And um, for every aspect, a detailed information about discussions, research, uh, choices that are made, um, Everything is gathered in one table, uh, is um, um, uh, compared to the actual set uh, goal or sustainability value. And so you can still check during the process if values are met or not. And if you need to do some extra things maybe. So this is basically the whole monitoring uh, process. And it also is a way of communicating back to your uh, community again to see or let them see you're still keeping track of your uh, ambitions basically. Well this is all being put in our Dutch uh, Milieu Effect Report or uh, in English you would say environmental uh, assessment uh, report or something like that. Uh, and normally in a traditional way it would uh, relate to a lot of well, conservative things, I would say. Uh, and now you see a lot of other discussions in this report as well. It's a, a total different report from uh, our traditional reports. Way more sustainable, basically. And now to the next slide. You'll see, oh, I'm going a bit quick. Some impressions that we've added as well. Um, which made it a, a livable city, basically. Um, so just for your interest. And you'll see different housing concepts, different areas to relax. I think 50% of the whole area is uh, green. Um, so way more livable. But back to the system again. So the pyramid started with values and visions translated into that the way of governance, uh, the, the three municipalities. Uh, and then the first step, the first smart layer was actually that connection to the wheel of Kylo, where we've created a system where uh, several topics could be discussed. 
And then systems are made, are being discussed, decisions are made, ambitions are made, which are in uh, light green in the, in the second uh, uh, picture. And then when those ambitions are set, uh, the next smart layer is keeping track of them with those tables that we used to communicate back to the community again. Um, this is basically a, a short overview on how um, some of our projects are run. Uh, not all of them, unfortunately. I think it's a diamond, like said before. Um, yeah, a good one to uh, start with. Yeah. Thank you so much, Niels. I think this is a very interesting approach to actually discuss these layers, which we have always been discussing about the governance values, but also to introduce the smart ideas in between and how this should be glued in between the two layers. Uh, so I think this is an interesting approach. You already, I was about to ask you this question that this, if uh, of course Archidis believes in the idea of sustainability, that's, that's the reason they have created this dashboard, but how many projects are actually being implemented based on this dashboard? Does this, is this something that is dependent on the client or on the support from the public sector or how does that work? Well, of course, we don't have the mandate to um, say we would like to implement this at all our projects because it's totally client focused. But it is our uh, ambition to have our own vision and focus as a way of presenting ourselves. Um, because we think we know, like everyone thinks no, or has their own opinion, uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to come up, uh, how to implement your values. And this is basically our vision on doing that. Uh, luckily, Kylo um, uh, liked this vision as well and uh, wanted us to work on it. Um, but not every project works like that, of course, no. Um, but we're trying to set it up as a model for more municipalities to um, uh, use it as, as some kind of process. Yeah. And maybe not with all of the people in the meeting here, but the, especially the, the, the first picture, top right corner, uh, it's quite known, the system itself, it's a Dutch uh, system, but actually keeping track of the process and implementing those um, ambitions, um, tools and whatever you're creating to, to, to uh, achieve your goals is the hardest part, which is not really in a, uh, set in a smart layer, in a, in a, in a, in a tool. Okay, thank you so much. I think... Uh... There might be other questions coming in already. Yep. Uh, Peter Vansky is from Breda. He's asking that, has the model also been used at bigger levels like City Visions? Yeah, um, not yet. Well, basically this is a neighborhood. So uh, you can see that this is kind of a, a city level as well, but only for one neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a good try for uh, this local level. Uh, but of course, the whole system is a system you can use for a larger level as well. Energy transition, etc. It's a system where you keep track of your uh, ambitions and goals. And that's, I think, the key uh, to implementing your visions and goals, keeping track of them and making people accountable. Because um, that's what's done in that table as well. People are named in that table. So they are owner of their own uh, measure or solution or whatever so i think it's possible in greater uh, or, or larger levels but it's not implemented yet in uh... so uh, uh another i think everybody thinks that this is quite interesting model and people are asking if this report is uh, available uh, to be shared for everybody so maybe it would be nice either you can put it on the chat or you can share it with us and we share it with the audience later Mm -hmm. uh, there are more questions coming in, but uh, uh, I think like we are running out of time. So, Paul, what do you think? Shall we go ahead with the next presentation and then see the take up the questions as a whole? Yes, I think we should. Um, so, please, uh, let's uh, yeah. continue with the next presentation. It would be very nice to see that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, our next presentation is from Be Sustainable and Seven and Har Harman would be representing them. This is a very uh, similar initiative what Archidus is doing 
So of course, we'll come back to the question because both are somehow based in the neighborhood scale or focuses the neighborhood scale as the first implementation scale. So it would be interesting to compare after your presentation so we can take up a few more questions after you have, you're done with the presentation. Yeah? Yeah. Severin, yes. uh, um, yeah, you have 15 minutes time. Uh, we are, of course, we are do, going late a bit, but uh, let's see your presentation and maybe a little bit of introduction of how the initiative is working with different organizations because you're uh, coming, you're representing uh, Be Sustainable, but you are actually working with Boer. So yes, indeed. that's also an interesting uh, collaboration to look at. Mm -mm. Indeed. Um, well, do you see my screen first because I shared the presentation? Is it yes. working? It works. It works. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. We are uh, very glad that you are interested in our uh, initi initiative in Brussels, and indeed, it's uh, much linked with the previous presentations. Um, however, uh, this initiative is uh, at uh, the regional level, so it's uh, come from uh, the Brussels Environment Institute from Brussels. And uh, we are working us as a subcontractor for uh, Brussels Environment Institute to develop this uh, platform, be uh, sustainable. So mainly that's why um, I'm employed by uh, Brussels Environment as a facilitator sustainable districts. So I will shortly present during these uh, 15 minutes what is the initiative about and some example of the project so that you can have like uh, an idea about what it is. It's uh, quite new uh, in the region, quite new for us too, but we are very uh, glad that uh, the region took this um, subject uh, into the hand and uh, are really proactive for the implementation of the neighborhood scale. So, where does it come from? This uh, Be Sustainable project is come from uh, by the international agreement, the UN uh, target in 2015, but as well from uh, our regional initiative. In Brussels, we have this uh, sustainable development plan. We have also the regional political declaration. And after all of uh, these events, the sustainable development plan for Brussels was uh, launched in 2018. Uh, we launched the platform Be Sustainable for the first time in October 2019. So we really worked with uh, all these agreements and um, at the different uh, level. And lately, uh, in May, uh, the regional governments um, approved the platform and uh, put it in the reglementation. So it's, uh, it's very, very new for us. The idea is a really like a co-creation um, project with the different um, institution uh, at the regional level. Um, first, uh, the Brussels Environmental uh, Institution that is uh, leading the project, but uh, also the, Brus the Perspective Brussels, which is in charge of um, the territory and um, urbanism at the regional scale. The BMA, which is the chief uh, architect in Brussels, the Baumeister, uh, in charge of the architectural quality of um, the region. The SIU uh, and the urban uh, Brussels for the heritage and um, uh, patrimonium in, uh, in Brussels. So the idea it was really like uh, of uh, the idea of co-creation this platform defining um, really like set up a goal of uh, common goals that we can follow to uh, build the sustainable neighborhood in Brussels but also to uh, like renovate some uh, some neighborhood uh, in the region uh, we are really like as uh, be sustainable it's really like a tool um, and an that it's on the link between uh, the regulatory tools, but operational tools and strategic tools. It's a uh, guidance and reference tool only. Um, our platform, it's, um, so this is a screenshot of the platform that you can find online. Um, it's a platform that uh, brings together all the actors 
that they are uh, active in the in the region uh, on this uh, subject. Uh, sorry for now, it's only in French and Dutch, but uh, later on it will be translated in English too. And um, this is the way for us, the, the platform uh, for exchanging uh, with uh, good practices like uh, inspiring as well with some uh, references, case studies, but also find our toolbox, uh, our philosophy about uh, behind uh, this uh, project. So it's uh, really the idea of uh, linking all these different actors that they are proactive into the region in one common uh, platform and to create together. Um, so the district uh, facilitator, the facilitator sustainable neighborhood is really um, the link with uh, the Brussels environment which initiate uh, the this neighborhood platform but as well uh, the users, like uh, project developer, but uh, designers, landscaper, and so on. And the experts, because uh, Brussels has different uh, experts uh, in, um, that they are uh, operating in the region. And uh, well, the technical uh, committee, so the regional uh, administration. So our um, objective as a facilitator is really to make this network uh, work together all these people from this network and uh, to make them collaborate and to also uh, answer to some needs of uh, specific needs of the user depending of, of the of the project uh, that we are working on so we in, we define the charter of uh, what is for us uh, sustainability uh, inside uh, the, at the neighborhood uh, scale. And um, we, uh, we believe that sustainability is uh, linked with transversality. So it's uh, not, we have like a 10 thematic, we have defined 10 thematic from a vision, human, man, spatial, mobility, nature, uh, water, uh, physical energy and matters that are linked with uh, the subject of uh, the sustainability and we really uh, try to work uh, in uh, transversality between all this thematic uh, in order to um, achieve like the um, a good sustainability in our uh, neighborhood at the neighborhood of course we are also aware that um, these 10 thematic are not uh, working like isolated as it was presented before, but it uh, was to be more clear. We are also aware that the thematic are functioning in the context and uh, they are much linked uh, with uh, other uh, elements that uh, make the complexity of, uh, of a city. So that, that's why um, the contextualization for us is uh, really important and our approach will be uh, unique uh, depend on um, the context that we are working on. This is our guideline. Thus, for instance, in some projects, we will more focus on the human aspect or mobility of water of matters, depend of really like uh, the, the project. That's um, what does the project needs to be more sustainable. Based on this uh, chart and this uh, ten thematic that um, we, uh, we identified, uh, we develop a toolbox uh, that we use uh, in our practice as a sustainable uh, neighborhood um, facilitator. Uh, the toolbox is um, composed by four tools. So you have uh, here a scheme that presents from the most general to the most detailed uh, tool. Um, I will go uh, into each of these tools to give you a glimpse of what does he uh, compose about. So first, the tool is the charter, so the policy declaration, that's all the authorities of uh, the region sign and agreed on. Um, this uh, is the, the ten thematics of uh, what is a sustainable neighborhood and what are the targets that we have to, uh, to achieve in the sustainable neighborhood according to these uh, ten thematics. Uh, the ten, these ten thematics are also the thematics that we, are, we use in Brussels at the building scale. So uh, it's uh, something that we, uh, we took from um, the sustainable um, 
building agreement too. And uh, that is the char charter uh, approved by uh, all the regional authorities uh, in, in Brussels. But the second tool that we have is the quick scan that uh, it's uh, online as well on the, on the platform of uh, Be Sustainable. And this is a fast analysis tool. Uh, uh, well, if we, if we were um, together in front of each other, I would have given it to you a hard copy. However, you can find this copy uh, online in Dutch and, uh, and French. Um, the, it's really like the, the idea is to quickly analyze uh, the sustainability of uh, your project. Uh, so, or you can do uh, this analysis uh, during the first step of your project or even before starting a project and to identify the um, thematics that need to be more highlighted uh, into the project than others, for instance. So, the quick scan is about uh, 50 indicators divided into these 10 thematic. This is an uh, Excel sheet that you can uh, download uh, from the platform. And uh, usually this is um, mainly the uh, practitioners that they use it to assess the project uh, quickly or the authorities that they are uh, drafting the specific clauses, for instance, for a, for a project. So it's about yeah, 50 indicators, like I say, divided in 10 thematic. Here, for instance, is a screenshot of the quick scan for uh, the thematic spatialization and see a certain number of questions and then you can um, you can assess your project according to the context the ambitions and the project itself how does it perform so the the third tool which is uh, like uh, really the assessment tool of our toolbox that uh, we use us as a district uh, neighborhood of um, sustainable um, facilitator neighborhood. Uh, this is uh, the compass and the compass actually it's uh, the extension of the quick scan uh, since it's about 200 indicators. Um, you can also download it from our platform um, but mainly it's us that we use it or the authorities um, and we, we help the, the authorities to, to assess the sustainability of the project according to this uh, 10 thematics and uh, also to see how does the project perform according to this thematic and to uh, identify the improvement possible for instance uh, in mobility or energy and so on and to also uh, like be sure that the project meets the ambition of uh, the developer so that's uh, the, 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 the purpose of this uh, of this tool uh, we also use it uh, to draft the technical clauses with the authorities um, to select the, the project, to make the assessment of the, of the project, the support for the development of technical specification. And the, the last tool that you can find in our platform is, about, is the documentation. So mainly the memento on each thematic. Uh, most of them are already online, maybe two or three needs to be finished, we are polishing them, and uh, the references. So, um, as I said previously in the introduction, uh, we have the ambition through the Be Sustainable platform to really create a network to, uh, that uh, will fit uh, each other, that's it. So, um, this uh, reference um, is also for us an opportunity to share the, what we think as good practices, but to our, uh, through our network. That's um, the, about the, the toolbox and the four tools that we, we work with uh, in the daily Brussels context. In terms of services, so we have this toolbox that uh, us as a facilitator sustainable neighborhood, we provide some services for, um, for the authorities and um, for uh, the, the designers. So we organize workshops and training around uh, these 10 thematics. We draft the workshops and training according to the needs of uh, the developers and of the designer. And um, we identify the experts uh, that would be interesting to, uh, to welcome in this uh, workshop to um, really like fit the um, 
the discussion and the project uh, on, uh, on itself. So we are part of the organization of this training. We are also part of, uh, we also organize visits and uh, trips, uh, mainly uh, in Europe or not. Uh, but uh, so lately it was, uh, we, we did in uh, Leuven, but also in Lille, in France, where we invite um, the stakeholders of the um, different uh, Brussels institution to take part of these uh, visits. And it's really the idea of not uh, staying at a theory theoretical level, but also uh, see uh, in a more like uh, realistic and uh, on-site uh, what is happening uh, on this uh, thematic of uh, development of sustainable neighborhood project. So we provide support uh, actually into uh, the uh, fifth phases of uh, the development of a sustainable neighborhood and our ambition of course is to be uh, involved from the beginning from the uh, context then after we follow them in the ambition the conception and the implementation and the gestion of the, the project the assessment uh, but it's true that sometimes uh, we we don't manage to arrive uh, in the context but we are more in the conception or ambition but really now the, the ambition of this sustainable is to be present from the beginning of the project and to follow the development of the project um, uh, in uh, all over the, the phases of the, of the district as example i just uh, put it here uh, some uh, pictures of some projects that we uh, we support uh, since 2016 we have supported uh, more than uh, 15 projects um, what is interesting to know is also that we support projects at different scale, uh, means that uh, from the master planning to the planification itself, depend of the needs of, uh, of the developer, but we are on the different um, scale of intervention since 2016. And uh, maybe if we drop into this uh, late, late project, uh, Petit Hill uh, City Gate, that started in 2017, um, it, was, it is for us a very interesting project, all of the projects are interesting of course, but this one uh, mainly because we have been present since the beginning of the, um, of the project, so in phase one, to, because the, the, the policy, the, the stakeholders were very proactive and uh, they contacted us since the beginning. Um, so we help them to, to draft and to support, we support them to, to draft the technical clauses. Uh, the last um, action that we have done for them, for instance, uh, it's uh, this workshop in uh, March where we um, organize a workshop for uh, the project developer and the design studio. Uh, so it was architects from uh, London, um, but also from all around Belgium that are not really familiar for instance, uh, with the Brussels context. And um, the focus for this workshop was really the thematic uh, what and not, and we invite the, um, the experts uh, from Brussels Environment to um, work on their project on these two thematic and to see with them uh, the improvement possible for uh, future development of, uh, of the project since we are now on the phase of the, the conception phase is already um, passed, but in March it was really still the, the conception phase ongoing. Um, it was also uh, during this uh, workshop an opportunity uh, to bring them to, to visit uh, the Rotor factory, which is a factory that uh, is uh, specialized in reusing material in, uh, in a Brussels uh, context. So what are the matter stocks stock that we have in, uh, in Brussels? Uh, how, can, how can it be used in the, in the project? That was really uh, the idea of to link uh, their project to uh, the, con the, the context uh, itself. So that was the last workshop that we, we organized for uh, this, uh, this project. And now, as I said, uh, the conception phase is uh, almost finished and we are um, little by little starting with the uh, implementation uh, on site with, uh, with this project. But I want to stress here that uh, we have been able to work from the first um, phase because the local authorities were really proactive and they involved it us. So without that, uh, it wouldn't have been possible. 
So it was really a, a chance for us and uh, we are collaborating really great with, uh, with them um, lately. Okay, I guess I will stop uh, here, uh, the presentation of Be Sustainable, just to let you know that um, everything is, uh, is on our platform. Uh, we have also a newsletter that you can uh, subscribe in and to, to keep updated about what is happening uh, with us and uh, in Brussels. And well, I hope that uh, it has uh, been inspired for, for you uh, and uh, I'm here if you want to talk more about it. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Severin. Uh, I think some of the audience were all already asking for uh, your website, for the correct website to find you. So you might be receiving some questions through them. Uh, I think this is very interesting. And also, as I mentioned at the beginning, that how different or how similar the approaches are from your end and from Archidus end. This is really special, your initiative coming from five government or public authorities, the support that you're getting in, and also it is actually being implemented in different phases. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be nice uh, to take up some questions and discuss on that. Uh, I want to mention that we are really far ahead of time. So maybe it's a good idea to alter the program a little bit. Uh, Matthias uh, Lehner, I would like to invite you to switch on the video. So I think that it would be nice if we can uh, do a short question answer round and a conclusion from your end. And after that, when the breakout rooms part can be a bit more informal, more with the borrel part. So the Miro and everything can be discussed there, but a bit more informally because otherwise we are losing people. We are already out of time. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah, it's fine for me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Niels, are you there? Uh, maybe it would be nice to take some questions for uh, Archides and Be Sustainable together. So uh, from uh, uh, Caroline Nevian was already mentioning that a similar uh, platform where this kind of interaction is happening, which is uh, Open Research Amsterdam. So I'll share uh, the, maybe Leah can share the uh, website, uh, the link in the chat box. So it would be very similar to what Be Sustainable is doing and it can be a more interactive platform. So it's good for everybody to look at it. And uh, Flip was also asking something. Maybe Flip, you're already there. You can ask directly. What, what I was wondering about um, uh, in both presentations is um, uh, it should be so um, you are making it very measurable. Uh, you try to measure if uh, the gains are uh, met. Um, but some things are not measurable. Uh, uh, happiness or uh, health or uh, aesthetics they are not measurable, but um, one should uh, do uh, uh, in a project uh, his utmost to reach uh, and to do to, to do everything possible to make it as good as uh, as you can. But you cannot measure if uh, a goal is met. How do you uh, cope with those? Uh, items, uh, for instance, uh, spatial quality or identity, as uh, Arcade said, I think that's difficult. Maybe I can uh, can answer to that uh, if it's, uh, because it's really a question that we are uh, tackling as well uh, in uh, in Brussels, and we are perfectly aware about it. Uh, it wasn't clear maybe in my presentation, but indeed Be Sustainable, it's a qualitative tool. That's the idea. There is no um, um, objective for a quantitative. So in the end, it's really the quality that we try to, to assess. In assess in brackets, I don't know another word for that. But, uh, and also that's why in our 10 thematics, we have the thematic uh, human, for instance, or man. And they are very um, strong uh, in the objective of the development of the sustainable uh, neighborhood for uh, Brussels. So um, 
the question of the participation, but uh, not only, uh, also the socio-economical uh, aspects are taken into account in our uh, analysis of the context and of the project. Uh, the ambitions that we want to have behind this, uh, it's really part of our, uh, of our work. Um, on top of that, we have uh, the network of Be Sustainable is not only made by technic technicians, I mean to say like uh, engineers or experts, but uh, we have uh, also uh, like a lot of uh, sociologues that they are working with us, um, urban sociologues. So we are really a uh, pluridisciplinary disciplinary, uh, network. And this is, uh, to, to at least for us, the, the way to try to answer of this complexity of the urban environment. Mm -hmm. It's how we are working. Yeah, okay. Maybe I can add to that as well. Um, I don't totally agree with you, Flip. Um, of course, you have the qualitative part, uh, like said as well. Um, and in that qualitative part, you have the discussion with people. And if you ask people, in a uh, group discussion with those 80 people together, like what brings you happiness and what in an area where you walk through makes you happy, uh, they will come up with concrete measures or concrete solutions in, a, in an area uh, where maybe their kids need to play in an area and then they are happy or loads of examples that are uh, possible. Um, but without uh, making these measurement or measures and solutions quantitative, you can't react uh, uh, in a proper way. Like uh, if those measures are not being implemented anymore in a quantitative way, uh, qualitatively uh, you will um, uh, um, will not meet your goals anymore. So that's why you need the link in the whole tool in the whole system. Um, is what we think. Don't know if that's. Uh, yeah, I I um, uh, I don't really agree. I think um, uh, it's uh, because what the, the good part is uh, you have the discussion. You have uh, you are walking with uh, the people uh, in the neighborhood. Um, uh, it's all about communicating much more than about measuring. I think uh, so. Uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, scary of those uh, Excel sheets with uh, 200 uh, items you have to uh, uh, check. Um, I don't think that will help you much further. Um, we had, of course, uh, uh, 20 years of experience with uh, 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 Velstans Notas, the, the uh, uh, official documents that uh, uh, set the criteria for the um, evaluation panels of uh, building schemes. But those criteria cannot be very strict. They have to be uh, relative, not absolute. Uh, and they have to be the basis for the discussion, not the basis for the uh, evaluation or the... Uh, the, the uh, no, but Indeed, Philippe, uh, it's really like the, the idea behind Be Sustainable is the base of a discussion uh, to, to drive the, the better way to build a sustainable neighborhood, let's say. So at least with these 200 indicators, like you say, if it's, uh, it looks uh, very huge and it's very uh, easy as a work, but uh, we, we try to really tackle all these aspects without for, forgetting, uh, because it's easy, to, it's easy in a sustainable neighborhood to, uh, to tackle only the energy aspect, for instance, or the nature, because uh, we all know what we are talking about and uh, we can uh, have some qu quantitative uh, behind that, but it's more difficult at the humans and at the society. So that's really our goal uh, to be sure that is not um, the, 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 the designer and um, they don't forget it. So, uh, and then it's a base of discussion. And, uh, and then we are going to, uh, to bring on board of the, of the project, the local um, association, we are organizing participation, but they really like, uh, uh, let's say that we will never select in Brussels a project that doesn't show that they are taking that into account and prove to us that their methodology includes this part 
in the methodology, but in the budget and in the vision of the development of the neighborhood. Okay. So that's really our, um, our goal and our target. Yeah. That's why we develop a, such a big, let's say. But really, uh, I think it's uh, really important, and uh, we have a big discussion on that in Be Sustainable. Um, we, we, we are also here because we are interested to, to share with you uh, this tool, but also to receive some uh, critics and uh, to improve it. So if you can uh, go on the platform maybe and look at it and maybe give us an, uh, a feedback on it, we will be very much interested to receive it. Because it's something for us very important and uh, we, we try to, to do it as, as good as possible. Let's say. Yeah. Thank you. There was a, a discussion hap, uh, happening during the panel, in, in actually both the panel discussion from Caroline as well as coming from Martina and Marcia uh, about the differences in practice and how to actually include students in this kind of discussions or the academia part. So there is a similar question coming up in the chat. As, um, Samia is asking that, uh, does uh, initiatives like Be Sustainable offer some kind of training to the students where they can learn to implement these things in practice much more from the beginning rather than learning or these initiatives or learning to put it in practice later? Yes. Well, uh, as you saw, uh, Be Sustainable is quite a young uh, initiative. We are just being approved by the government uh, in May, last May. So for now, our target is really uh, the practitioners to make them uh, like use it and the local authorities. So we try to develop our network and that has become part of uh, the daily uh, work. Yeah. However, um, well, I'm, uh, I'm myself uh, engaged in the university. So in the design studio, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we are giving some uh, intervention and um, like also some conferences to, to the students. This is not the target of Be Sustainable. However, the, this is for the future, of course, that to, to, to really like uh, bring on board the students and we start just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe Carolina can uh, add something to it from Open Research Amsterdam. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you both for a nice presentation. Um, I was just really curious about how international agreements actually affect your work, which was the subject of this talk. And indeed, Open Research Amsterdam is also exists now for three years. Collaboration between all the universities in the city, the region and the economic board and the municipality. It has a governance structure, which is really cool. Created with 10 lawyers that we can all share knowledge. And it has now uh, 2,000 members and over 3,000 research items that are re of relevance to the current challenges of the city. So please feel free to look at it. Uh, but I was, I was curious in, I mean, I, I recognize classical design approaches, very well executed. So very nice to see that this whole design thinking got so deeply into your companies. But uh, what is your, uh, how do you deal with the international agreements? How do they influence you? And maybe also how do international trade agreements influence your work? That's Especially a good design. question, uh, I think, Caroline. Um, Again, on a personal level, um, I think a lot of young colleagues uh, together are joining together in our company, uh, creating discussions about sustainability, how sustainability uh, should be implemented in our projects and stuff like that. Um, really driven by progress, uh, progressive young uh, uh, engineers or not even engineers, but uh, just free minded people uh, working for us. Um, and that discussion is being brought to uh, our projects. Uh, and of course, uh, international agreements are there and are helped to structure those kind of discussions maybe and, and give guidance, but not more than that, basically. Um, we are a uh, client-focused company and we're not a municipality who needs to uh, stick to those uh, kind of um, uh, agreements. And that's the difference maybe. Uh, we are not led by um, uh, people from the municipality who need to uh, adapt to those agreements or uh, meet those agreements. 
Yeah. You are uh, you are subject to international trade agreements, though. That that's true, definitely. So how do they affect your work? Uh, they affect our discussions. So uh, we are uh, also worried about: do we meet those uh, goals or not? And how do we encourage our uh, clients to uh, to stage um, to uh, contribute? Contribute indeed to those goals. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the best feelings that you can help those clients basically uh, with setting those goals and achieving them mm -hmm. to contribute. Yeah. Well, I can add as well that uh, mainly what I see in our practicing bureau, for instance, uh, we use this agreement to support our uh, idea. So we are using them as uh, references, and uh, it's also something that we yeah using most for. But also for Be Sustainable, for instance, as you saw in the first slide or second slides, it was for us like a, a base, let's say, to draft the, the project. So yeah. it's also uh, for us a very important base. Um, and uh, that's, of course, will impact also the development of the project because Be Sustainable is a tool that uh, uh, today I, I presented uh, with this same thematic, but maybe it will evolve in the future, uh, depend on um, how we go home and so on, so it's something that is not fixed. It's, uh, yeah, because one would expect, like, like we in, in the beginning, I said, I, to me it looks like all those international agreements mostly affect the work of experts. Uh, so that's, you are the expert, so then I expect, I would have expected you to say, no, they are very important for me. We know the Paris Agreement by heart. We work with that. Uh, you know? I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I mean, also a colleague of Amsterdam, Dagmar Keim, is pointing out, you know, that, for example, in the donut uh, circular economy, the, the SDGs are very uh, are foundational to the donut of Cape Rayworth. Uh, apparently, there is the city index from the International Federation of Housing. So um, she points out that for the experts, these agreements are really important. But those are the experts within the municipality. You are mm -hmm. expert outside the municipality, working with different levels of or, uh, government. So I would expect that for you, these uh, these agreements are very important. No, that, of more like, like, like a menu of, of what you like and what you say it legitimizes our work, and you say, oh, we pick and choose what we like. Quite shocking, right? Rather, as an answer for both of you. I think also the difference with Bure and Arcadia is Arcadia. Sorry, we have inside our um, practice also a very big part, part of the research. So we develop also our own vision on what is for us the sustainable uh, city. So it's something that we think about, and of course we take as a base these agreements. However, we are thinking and we are taking the time to develop our own argumentation behind it. And you say you know, that, that your the young colleagues really are, are into this. Mm -hmm. So what is the sort of um, discussion or what is the resistance that you walk into with young well, people? I think, Caroline, um, you would be surprised on how many clients of us are actually not really uh, focused on those uh, international agreements, even municipalities uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's why I think we need to take that step to um, first convince them and to take them a step further. Um, because I think your vision on how municipalities think about the agreement and know, the, know them by heart is not entirely true for all municipalities. I, know. Them, but I, know. I just thought it's such a nice image, you know. We have these agreements and all these civil servants, they just do this, you know. <laughs> well, but that's, I think, in a way, Krylo is one of those projects as well. I mean, I, I know by heart that they have ambitions way, way bigger than just the climate uh, agreement in, set in Paris, uh, because they know they want to do something special, create a diamond. Uh, and that's what a lot of colleagues in Arcadis want as well. But there are also a lot of colleagues who are really conservative and even some climate uh, uh, how do you call them? Uh, people yeah. who, who well, don't even agree to the whole climate problem, which is good for a discussion as well. Uh, you need that whole discussion, but uh, I don't think we have a agreement known by heart, as you say. No, we have our own visions on 
uh, how we can be sustainable and hopefully meet those uh, agreements in the end. I thought it was so shocking that uh, I think it was in 2015 or 2016, before we were, we were arguing for over 50 years with the Club of Rome as the first one, that climate change was happening. Yeah, so it was all the time denied. And then suddenly all the companies saw that there was a lot of money yeah. actually dealing with climate resilience. So as of 2015 or 16, I don't know exactly when, there was an overnight change of all the companies, including Arcadis and so, we are now your solution to climate change. I thought, finally they believe it because they see we can't stop it anymore and there's money in it. Quite shocking as, as just as a, as, a, as a normal person. But, uh, it took us such a long time to, you know, to accept it and even Paris was a big, big dissolution for many people because it didn't go far enough. And uh, now we, we all say, oh, did you see it? Yeah, Groenland, yeah, all glaciers disappear. Oh, quite amazing, isn't it? Indeed, not only uh, it's so hard to understand. companies or advisory companies, but also the municipalities themselves, the public, uh, the, the public community themselves think more about shared concepts of mobility, energy, energy transition, uh, you name it. There are like topics all over uh, the place now at, the, at this moment and only for a couple of years since I've been uh, beginning to work basically. Well, maybe in that respect, because I think we have to wrap up now. Uh, and, and but I, I do think I would like to advise you to 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 read the two articles that I used for my short introduction. I I thought them at the time very much uh, sort of opening your eyes of what's happening. And maybe even for the Dutch colleagues, I think it's interesting to read to read. Uh, um, uh, the uh, the addition to uh, the addition three actually to the uh, uh, to the report made on the nitrogen uh, crisis, um, uh, which gives you a very good insight into how these things go wrong actually, and uh, and I think it's very in very important to understand that and to learn from that, uh, so not to make uh, the same mistakes again. Yeah. Thank so, you. Rita, maybe you want to. to I was saying that I think this is a miscommunication or blaming game between the private and public authorities all the time. So maybe this is some dialogue that we still need to establish in a more efficient way. But on a positive note, uh, there is a, a good comment from Dagmar, city of Amsterdam. She's saying that as a practitioner, I would like to use these agreements to structure initiatives like these, which have been, which we saw as examples today from uh, both the presentations to understand uh, also the local level, the impact of local level in the bigger picture. So this is something which is useful as a discussion. And uh, of course, we are here to learn. So I uh, give the floor to Matthias to conclude the session with uh, all these agreements and disagreements. Uh, what do you have to say, Matthias? No disagreements here, no? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Alan Krita, and uh, thank you. Uh, for me, the task uh, running late on the schedule to summarize uh, this uh, fantastic uh, conference and maybe to inspire you again once more. So thank you, Alan Krita and Paul, for asking me to do this. This is not an easy task. And uh, many compliments, of course, also to the experts we have been uh, listening to today. Uh, I think the shortest summary, of course, is that we see uh, today um, it's possible to do new planning and involve these international agreements. Uh, we see it's feasible uh, to bring this thinking of value into practice. Uh, it happens already, we can see this, but we also saw there's still a way to go. And um, I think I'm very happy also, I'll go into more detail with some of my notes, what I, what I heard, but what I liked, of course, working for the Royal Institute of Dutch Architects and being an architect myself, I think that architects, they have a special role in this process. And that was mentioned also by a couple of experts. They, um, it's not only architects on designers, of course, we heard that too, it's clients, uh, private uh, clients, it's government parties, the bureaucracy as it was uh, named uh, before. Um, they are, these are involved also, and they are necessary partners and stakeholders when it comes to this uh, process. Um, 
So I think within architecture, there, there is a couple of aspects which helps. It's a creative uh, group of people. It's about how solving problems. It's coming with new solutions. So it's different as we heard also today from alpha uh, scientists uh, who have exact results to exact problems, but it's different in architecture. And it, it inv involves uh, image and imagination. And what we also learned with uh, BNA in the past is that people are willing to create other values, uh, uh, economic values, social values, and many others we've heard of here today in this conference. And we, we did this also, we did an exercise at the Expo Real, which is a real estate fair in Munich, uh, one of the biggest in Europe. And we asked architects and clients to talk about their projects, but in the meaning of the social, ecologic and economic value. And they tried hard and they will try much harder in the future, I think, because it's a new vocabulary which we are not yet used. Maybe the social value is very clearly, but it is not expressed or focused upon. So thinking in these different uh, dimensions of values, the Brundtland criteria, as we all know them, I think is, uh, is very important and possible. And I'm, I, I'm thankful for your remark, I think, Caroline, was that uh, there's not many parties do, dealing with the SDGs yet, you said, if I may quote that way. And we did in February, we did an, um, with BNI International uh, Make Happen Inspiration Conference focusing entirely on the SDGs. And we did some research also with our friends from the Royal Institute of British Architects. And there is a couple of SDGs where, of course, sustainable cities being one architects really can make a difference and can contribute to these SDGs. Probably will not help hunger out of the world, but many others uh, of these SDGs are part of uh, the work we do. And I think which is also interesting when it comes to different forms of value is what we do with the BNA Onderzoek. And of course, uh, Vereniging Delta Metropol knows BNA Onderzoek very well, BNA Research in uh, Dutch. And that's, uh, I'm involved a lot in European collaboration and that's something which is very unique to Holland. It's an initiative where architects, clients, uh, stakeholders are involved to define the the objective, the task, to design the design task before actually giving away a design task. So you have, when it comes to the uh, city of the future, how to treat a building as a water machine, how to develop a, a multi-purpose nodes uh, in the area of Amsterdam, to be in conversation with each other and define actually what is at stake, what is the task we are looking at, and what are the values that we would like to achieve. And then comes the design. So that's all pre-design and pre-concurrent and you meet each other. And I think Philip said that also, and, and you meet each other on the values you're looking forward, uh, not so much the interest. So what we learned so far, I would like to share is first of all, that you should define, of course, what you would like to achieve, what values would you like to achieve? And then, of course, you execute it and you, uh, you plan, you make the planning, maybe you execute a building. But then, and then we come also to what we have heard from Severin and also from uh, Niels um, and from uh, Building Holland and other companies. You have to document actually what you're doing. And maybe I understand Flip completely. It's worrying to see tables with 200 indicators, but still it's necessary in such a way or a different way to monitor actually what you are doing. I, do you stick to your uh, uh, ambition? When you win a tender uh, promising that you will improve biodiversity and nobody will look later if you ever do it. So it, 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 you have to monitor what you're doing and agree on how to, it, what is the task? What is the objective? What value are you looking for? And how can you measure it? And some are very difficult to measure and some are easier to measure. And you have to think about and, and make agreements uh, about them. And then you will hopefully avoid what Caroline, what you told us that the grass has been mowed, uh, uh, the, the food forest has been mowed 55 times because you agreed on the ambition, but you did not agree on the monitoring and on the practice. And that's an important part. So when I look at the first part of our conference when we talked about the role and purpose i think what i wrote down and which is important there's a difference flip said that between interest and value and you can meet 
on the mutual value and then you come and set the second or third steps. I think that's very good. I like the paradox, Caroline, you, you pointed out that some people think I have so many problems at home, I cannot look into international agreements. And I don't know if you, it was you or somebody else who said, you have to go international, you have to go to the world, otherwise the world comes to you. And it's probably, I would add, not the way you want it. Maybe it's a landslide coming down or a glacier falling on your head or something like that, monsoon rain drowning your cities. And then I think the most beautiful quote, and if I would make a little report on this conference, uh, as working for the Royal Institute of Dutch Architects, I wrote down, the marriage between research and policy can only be solved if design joins in. So that looks like a very new form of marriage actually with these three involved, but uh, I think we should be open for it. And I would like to ask, uh, to add what Terry said from Groningen, knowing does not lead to acting, design does. And I'm not sure if he, he made this uh, quote himself, but I love it. <laughs> And uh, we experience this also when we work with BNA on the soup, when we develop scenarios, when we come with design proposal, not complete solutions, but different solutions, different options. When you come into contact, you talk, you come into movement. So when I look at the second part of this conference where we talked about the values, I liked a lot what uh, Marcia said. She said, values, what does that mean? And that's a very crucial question. And we heard of our experts of a couple of principal values, like shit, in a capitalistic system, the long-term solution, the sustainable solution might not be the most attractive one. So there's an implicit call for looking at it differently than from a capitalistic point of view. We had the aspect of data. We need the data, we want to know it. But who's that? So the ownership of data is a value. Who owns it and how can we use it? Then we heard about a couple of process values. I liked a lot what Martina says from Delft. The legislation period is very short. So you never can succeed. You only can go in a certain direction, in the good direction. And actually you have to think about the guy or woman who comes after you so that they continue in the right direction. So this is a process value like the same that we have to learn to fail and we have to accept that we make mistakes while we try to reach for these values. And yes, Martina, you said, elder men don't like it. Politicians don't like failure, but probably will need them to find the right solution. And then coming back to Marsha and to others also, also to you, Flip, I think, there's values for citizens. We should uh, look into it. Um, space was a problem, a bikeability I wrote down, accessibility in a city, livability, health, all these values, the, the, the storytelling, I think it was mentioned, how you, how you talk about the value, nobody understands 30% less of CO2, but we all understand I can bike with my uh, bike to my school. I don't have to park. I don't have to use the car, but it's very easy to access all the things by bike, for example, and thus uh, getting a lower CO2 um, uh, emissions. Um, I liked a lot also, maybe you remember, um, you have to involve the people to make them understandable, these values, and that's the strength of the UN SDGs. We all understand them. And if we don't make it understandable, we will get this nice quote, uh, we will not participate, but we will be participated. Being participated. Yeah. yeah, and that's a major difference. And then uh, to come to the third and last part, we have listened with the people who really work in practice. And Severine, I really loved your uh, uh, toolbox and I uh, understand it's all very new and I'm very excited that you shared this with us and immediately the comment from the municipality of Amsterdam which is a cool municipality they say I want to integrate this so I think there you really made something happen here um, but looking also at what Neil said um, they developed a dashboard for sustainability to map the ambition to map the potential end and here I am again to monitor how you reach the value. 
And yes, he said, well, we are a private company, we cannot enforce this. The projects that are run with this methodology, they are the diamonds and some people go for diamonds and some people, and I cannot translate this, I go for the double tier of the erste rang, but uh, maybe Paul, you can say what that is in English. So it's necessary to do these diamonds, it's necessary to do these lighthouse projects and to go through the efforts of uh, monitoring and uh, actually mapping ambition and potential. And then Severine, I think it's a pleasure to end with some stuff you uh, were telling us. Um, there is a toolbox, it's online, um, it's general and it's detailed. You say there is a quick scan tool um, and you said there is theory, but at the same time we have trainings, we do study trips with the people, developers, architects, stakeholders, we talk together, we get this, and then I'm here with you again, Flip, this same set of values which we would like to achieve. And I think this is really very promising. And since 2016, 15 of the projects have been monitored, you said, with probably more than 200 uh, categories. Uh, but uh, I think we should not be afraid about that. Because when I look at, I'm teaching at the Academy of Architecture and I'm teaching urbanism and architecture and I have young students and I go with Niels, what he says uh, from Arcadis. Uh, these people want to contribute. If I, I teach looking at the city as an ecosystem, this is a complex matter and we don't know, we don't completely understand how it works. Biodiversity, oh my God, how can we increase it? It's really difficult. How, we, how can we increase quality of life? But these students want to know. They want to be excellent designers. They want to be stuff flip you like at the Federatie of Ruimtelijke Qualiteit. But they also want more. They want to contribute to a global system to minimize the impact. Uh, when I eat meat, I feel, I feel bad when I talk to them, basically, because they have a completely new vision and I see you always smile, Alan Krito, when, there's, when we say, oh, these young people, they are consumers and not creators. And I'm not sure. I meet the creators as well. And I see you shake your head as well. So to come to a final conclusion, um, ladies and gentlemen, we saw a lot of inspirational uh, examples that it is possible to involve uh, sustainability agreements, international agreements in this new form of planning. Um, it is feasible. It's feasible to bring this thinking to the process. Yes, it's more complex. Yes, it's partly coming back from the 80s and was forgotten for 30 years. But we have better tools. We have uh, Google. We have other um, possibilities to do on our mobile phones. Maybe not me, I'm 48, but my students, they can. They can tell me about sustainability goals happening on their way. They know how many species of trees are standing along the bike path and they didn't count themselves. They just held a, mic a telephone towards them and they got answers from that. So it's possible. This is an important step, I think, this fantastic conference uh, to really get it top of our minds again. And I would uh, really like to finish my small summary with uh, the marriage between research and policy can only be solved if design joins in. And to too little imag imagination uh, of how these agreements could actually come in practice and designers can help to visualize it. Knowing does not lead to acting, design does. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. This was actually, yeah, everybody is clapping because this is really a nice conclusion that you have put in. You have like whatever notes I had written, whatever notes my colleague has written, you have said it all in a very crisp and strong statement. So it's uh, really nice that uh, we had this recap moment of the whole session. Thank you so much again, Matthias. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. I hope I learned a lot. And I have put down a to-do thing for me to discuss internally with Paul and our colleagues at Delta Metropole, which is to establish a kind of network with all the eldermen in the city, uh, uh, from Dutch eldermen of cities and the chief technological officers. So this kind of relation between policy 
and science can come together and it would be a nice discussion to actually have that maybe. So I'll still discuss that with Paul and see how we can include that in the new planning dialogue. Uh, we keep you updated with the results from today and uh, we hope to see you again in October with our two upcoming events. One Terry already discussed about the role of planner and role of planning and the other one about the mega regions focusing on Euro Delta. You can visit our website for more um, discussion about it. And lastly, I would like to mention that we are already started to develop the publication, the final cookbook, uh, compiling on the re results from these dialogues. So uh, we will share, you, uh, share with you a link where you can just let us know how you would want to contribute to the publication and it would be nice to co-create that process as well. Last, uh, any last comment from Paul? I. Um, well, thank you all very much. I think um, we also need to learn a little bit about the time management, but this is always very difficult in, in such a um, intense, uh, fully packed program. Uh, so thanks for uh, bearing in with us and hope to see you next time. Yes, hope to see you next time. Uh, I'm sending everybody in a breakout room. If you want to stay well and good, if you want to leave, that's also fine. We are not recording that session. Thank you everyone. Bye. Have a nice day.